Hello and welcome to the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Jeff Markey, a father. Oh, you did it again. I know. I was debating which it's way to go. It's still true. We'll stick with it for a little while longer. Uh, Leo Vader. Hello. Welcome, sir. And Ana Diaz. Hey. Welcome, Ana. Is you, uh, hey, Ana, is you, is your name, is it like Anastasia or anything full or is it just Ana? Mm-hmm. It's just Anna. Okay. Well, that's yeah. nice. I'm glad we got that cleared up on this episode because yeah. it's a very important yeah. episode. I thought uh, it was short for banana. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. It's always been short for banana, um, but I don't like to talk yeah. about that because it's really personal. It's kind of like an old family story, Leo. Come on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being here, everybody. We are covering a lot of stuff on this show. We're going to talk about the next deepest dive we're tackling. We are going to be talking about Watch Dogs Legion. Leo's full report coming in hot. Uh, a game called Teardown, which is very, very cool. Some other odds and ends. And then we'll be talking about Yakuza Like a Dragon, otherwise known as Yakuza 7, when we get Surreal in here. And then some odds and ends. I have to talk about Pumpkin Jack. I'm legally required to talk about Pumpkin Jack, the 3D platformer. Uh, and then back after the show, we're going to have Charles McGregor join us, a developer of HyperDot, to answer some great community questions. So it is a jam-packed, uh, jam-packed show. This is uh this is it. This is like the last week before next gen launches. I know there's a lot of other stuff going on this week, but it's just weird every once in a while to put things <laughs> no, in perspective. That's important thing. That like, oh, that's right. This is it. This is the end of the generation, even though it's a blurry line. But Jeffum, have you woken up in a cold sweat thinking about the next generation at all? Is it just in another world because you're too focused on taking care of your kid? Uh a little bit. I I guess I'm I'm looking a little more forward to it than I thought. I've, yeah. I've kind of, I, originally I was like, well, I'll just wait and get a PS5 sometime next year. And I'm, that's kind of inching up in my mind of like, it, it would be, it would be a nice distraction to get one of those things and just, you know, play, e- even if I'm still playing games from this year or previous years, just having them run nicer and look a little nicer. Yeah, have a funky being controller in, on, in your hand. Being in on that enjoyment of like that first rush of getting a new system and kind of the next the next cycle of all of this craziness. Yeah. And as far as next gen coverage goes from us, uh I'll be getting a PlayStation 5 hopefully on launch day. I should probably double check the Walmart order. Um, and so, yeah, I'll probably do a stream from my place showing off UI. We can run around, check out some different games and kind of answer a lot of questions, have a big celebration of when that thing comes out. And then my Series X isn't getting here until a couple days after it launches too. So I'll keep you in the loop on when that's happening. And we'll have some other folks jump in. Maybe we can kind of kick the tires on these new consoles together because it's an exciting time. Um, Leo, it's also a very exciting time because of this Saturday at roughly 8 a.m. Central, because what are we doing, dude? Extra life, baby. Woo! The biggest only, stream of the year. Only 24 hours this time instead of 25. Yeah, it's not landing on daylight savings time, so it feels like it's going to be a cakewalk. 24 hours? I mean, 25 will break a person, but 24, it could do that with our eyes closed. Absolutely. I'm uh, doing so it right now. Yeah. So we're teaming up with uh, Game Informer. It is going to be an extra life stream where it's Game Informer cross min max throughout the entire stream, jumping back and forth, different people on different segments. It'll be fun to tear down those walls. And it's a very dorky thing, Anna. But like when I think about lining up the schedule, the part that I get excited about is like, oh, it's going to be fun just to have like Anna thrown in playing Among Us with a bunch of Game Informer folks and just like intermingling that entire bubble is going to be fascinating. Yeah, I saw that I was the only person who did the little thumbs up from our team for Among Us. And yeah. I was like, okay, I have to I have to bring my A game so I can represent Min Max well. And don't tell them ahead of time, but yeah, if you're the imposter, I just want you to go on a murdering spree. Just target Is there the oldest. Anyone people. in particular you want me to murder? Um, mm. let's see. <laughs> I guess probably we all agree that it's Ben Reeves. Uh He's very confident. He's got to be taken down a peg. He has uh, it coming. Yeah, he's had it coming for a long time. Uh, but it'll be a very fun time. It's going to be streaming on our Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash minmaxshow, our YouTube channel, 
Uh, also, it's going to be on Game Informers, Twitch, and YouTube. Uh, so it's going to be impossible to miss it. So tune in anywhere. And all of the money that we raise there is going towards Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare in St. Paul, Minnesota, a uh, children's hospital. They've been great communicating with us so far and just talking about what a rough year it's been for them in particular uh, with COVID. And they're like, oh, also donations are quite down. Uh, so we could use the support. And I know a lot of people are probably feeling anxious, feeling stressed out this week. Um, I think it's going to be a very nice way to do something positive is to tune to the stream Make us do silly things by donating certain amounts. Also, we should point out that there's a bunch of donation incentives. So if you donate any amount during the Extra Life stream, you're in the running f to receive a random game code. And you might say, okay, random game code in the running. What does that mean? Um, Andrew Reiner over at Game Informer has done a great job collecting a ton of game codes from different publishers. So we literally have hundreds and hundreds of game codes <laughs> to give away. So if you donate any amount, there is a good chance you could get a full game code for a new game. Uh, so please check that out. And then there's higher donation incentives as well, including if you donate a certain amount, you can be a guest on the BinMax show. We'll have you on for community questions. Also, you can be a guest on Game Informer's Replay and the Game Informer Show podcast. There's a lot of fun things and a lot of fun incentives. Also, you know, we'll be doing a photo mode snap live. We're going to be playing a lot of Jackbox. We have some game trivia. Also, Leo, I don't know what this says about your character, but it only made sense for you to host the freak hours uh so you're gonna be taking over at like 1 a.m is that right yes it's gonna be chaos weird. mode yeah so we're kicking it off with uh a tabletop simulator stream where we're playing deck quest which leo tells us is basically D D. it's D D light it's D D if you don't want to do the smart guy stuff <laughs> That sounds perfect for us. So if you wanted us to play D&D, &D, you can tune into that late night block. It's going to be surreal. Also, we'll be doing a script reading of a uh, scrapped script for Indiana Jones 4. And people that donate can cast who is who for this entire script reading. And it's going to be a late night freak show in the best possible sense. So please tune into Extra Life. It'll be a very fun time. Uh, we look forward to hanging out with the Game Informer crew for 24 hours straight. Um, Leo, there's more table setting yet to do because okay. we just finished the deepest dive on The Thing, which was our first cross-media deepest dive um, where we covered every version of The Thing, which, Jeff, it's the best because it's like, I was talking about it on The Deepest Dive, you know, because we talked about The Thing for six hours or so, over six hours, I believe. But I love tackling a universe like The Thing because you can digest everything. If this was Star Wars, even if this was like Jurassic Park, there's too much. There's too many comics. There's too many side stories. You can't keep track of everything. With The Thing, we were literally able to digest and consume, <laughs> just like The Thing, every version of the story, like every comic book, every adaptation, every tabletop version. And it's so fun to have like this complete view of here's this property. Here's every angle they've tried to tell. Here's every time they've kind of broken their own rules across different medium. So it's a fascinating Deepest Dive. Uh, you can check that out. It's the first cross-media one. We'd love any feedback on what you think about the cross-media Deepest Dive. But we definitely agree that it's time to get back to basics and do a video game for the next Deepest Dive. Right, Leo? That's right. So we're debating what to do for the next Deepest Dive, the next huge community game club. Um, just in the interest of full disclosure, we were leaning towards Cyberpunk. And then it was delayed. Uh, so we're sort of thinking about what can we do in that gap? What can we do for Deepest Dive here? Um, and it seems like there's one game that's risen through the ranks where you can play it next gen if you want to. You can play it on current gen if you want to. There's a lot of interest in it. We like the last entry. So we will be doing the Deepest Dive on Spider-Man Miles Morales. You can play on whatever system you want, but uh, I am very excited. I don't want to announce it yet just in case anything falls through. But there is at least one special guest lined up that I was amazed they immediately said, yeah, of course, I'd love to be on it. So it'll be a fun is thing it, for, oh, yeah. Is it Miles Morales? I didn't want to oh. say, but it might just be a certain someone Ooh. named Miles Morales. Uh, so you can find The Deepest Dive, the best and most thorough discussion about Spider-Man Miles Morales on MinMax's YouTube channel. Or if you support us at the $5 tier on Patreon, you can unlock the podcast version of that and support us at any tier. You can submit a comment about the game for us to read on The Deepest Dive. And it looks like we're going to be breaking up into two sections. So The Deepest Dive and Miles Morales will air on November 18th and then 25th. So we'd appreciate the support. And if you support us at that tier, you also unlock all other podcast versions of the Deepest Dives in the past, like The Outer Worlds, Colonel Trigger, Animal Crossing, Final Fantasy VII Remake, What Remains of Edith Finch, Last of Us Part Two, Halo 1, Super Mario 64, and The Thing. 
It's been a busy year. It's crazy that we tackled all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. this will be a fun one. So please look forward to the deepest dive on Spider-Man Miles Morales. Also, did anybody else watch that trailer for the Spider-Verse suit in Miles Morales? Yeah. That honestly tripled my excitement for that game. That <laughs> is sure. the best. Like the way that it's animated on the twos, as they say. So it's animated at a lower frame rate, but still fully simulated in the frame rate. It looks so awesome i cannot wait to run around with that suit uh so please join us for that grand adventure we'd appreciate it okay enough rambling from me leo vader watchdogs my turn legion. to ramble yes please well hey let's, let's set the stage here um watchdogs legion came out last week anna have you played it yeah i popped into it and played uh, like some of the beginning i guess yeah. okay perfect jeff and where are you at with this thing I'm at the same place, I, about maybe in 90 minutes or so. Well, Leo, I know you're at least 12 hours into this game because you stream 12 hours and it's on you know, our YouTube channel right now if you want to watch Leo's raw reaction to this thing. But how much time have you put into this beast now? Like 24 now at this point. Okay. It was your most anticipated game since Metal Gear Solid 5. What do you think? I love it. I mean, it's not uh, the greatest game ever made. I think... What it's doing, which obviously everyone's heard at this point about its groundbreaking play as anyone functionality, where uh, everybody if you encounter in the game has certain traits and you can recruit them and they have can are fully voiced and you can play through the whole story with them. I think the ground they've broken by doing that system is unbelievable and it falls short in some ways, but it's like when I see people picking it apart, it's almost like I wish they would give it more credit for succeeding at all <laughs> with with such an ambitious thing yeah okay so what, what do you love about the system in general i definitely get lost in it like there's a story in the game apparently but i'll <laughs> i'm playing with permadeath on and it's like i'm constantly just working the recruitment system and trying to get a well-balanced team and to make sure i have a good hacker and a good person with like an albion outfit so i can go into the restricted areas and occasionally people die and so i've got to fill those holes back up oh and then God. just the emergent stories that you can pull out of that system of like the deep profiler is what it's called where you can see people's schedules see recruitment leads of like somebody's blackmailing them and you can go beat them up or kill them or just delete off their phone the blackmail information they've got and plus the way people have like friendly relationships, like you recruit someone and then you see their them hang out with their husband at the bar and their husband is immediately recruitable because they like you so much because you helped their wife with their problem. That's amazing. It's just truly endless. You'll truly just play for like hours and hours without even thinking about, oh, I haven't touched the story missions that I'm supposed to do. Do you think they're weak? Story missions? Yeah. No, I've been pleasantly surprised. As I finally, I'm like, it's time to dive into these. I've been really impressed. It's like some impressive linear stuff. When you get into like the story-based interiors without giving anything away, I've been really impressed with like the design and the a lot of the writing. Yeah. Not all the writing. They, it's, twice they've made the uh, uh, world's on the line, no pressure joke. <laughs> twice. They've done that, they done that twice. <laughs> So that was a ding for me. But well, overall, to different it. people because, you know, you can reuse lines if, it's, mm. if you're not saying it's the same person. That's a good point. Last person we said it to died, so <laughs> we can use it again. There you go. Recycle. Uh, Jeff, are you digging it so far? What do you think? Yeah, I've and, you know, I'm I'm early enough that I'm very cognizant that I haven't seen kind of those flaws and like repeating voices or anything like that. But this is the kind of like fantasy feature that i want in a game in terms of like being really big systems driven kind of change that we haven't seen in a lot of games like i would yeah. i i want this system in in a lot of open world games like there there is a tier of game because i've i saw one of one of the criticisms of it is that people have said that they actually really like the protagonist from watchdogs 2 and so they're kind of disappointed that you don't have a central scripted character and i never played watchdogs 2 so that i can totally understand that but just the watchdogs series falls into a tier of game for me like you know ghost recon and far cry and kind of even call of duty where just i don't really connect to a lot of the characters in those games to begin with 
And so kind of having this trade-off where every character is actually unique and having that that permadeath tension to it is so much more compelling to me than any kind of scripted character that, you know, I go on a mission and I fail the mission and it and the the impact of that is just reloading a previous checkpoint and, you know, doing it again until I get it right. Like that is that is so much less interesting to me. And this this has already made me so much more tense to the point where like I'm actually kind of I'm not driving like a maniac like I usually would in open world games. Like I'm kind of paying attention to traffic laws and stuff because it's like, <laughs> well, I, I don't want to get, you know, like into a huge shootout and lose this character because that's something that can actually happen for once in a game. And that to me is super cool. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you Plus, playing? Oh, go ahead. Plus, if you run into somebody on the street, you could like find their brother who has cool traits, but hates you because you ran over his sister <laughs> in the street or they'll like family members will kidnap one of your operatives. Sometimes it'll start this mission to go get them back. I really love the way that yeah. like everything you do has an impact. It really makes it feel like the people in this world are people in a way that an open world game has never yeah. done. Yeah, and I, I've been surprised by that in terms of just the first couple characters that I've gotten. Like they don't they don't feel like just a random mishmash, you know, like like it hasn't like if if you just gave me my my you know, the first couple characters that I had, they wouldn't feel that out of place in one of these types of games. Like I wouldn't think, oh, that's just a random crap procedural games don't work. Like, you know, the the voice acting is fine. The dialogue doesn't seem like it's been written by a computer or anything. And and I, I feel more of a connection to that character just because they are unique to my game. Yeah. Well and Okay. Something that I've been enjoying about this game is that, you know, we talk a lot about like open world games and like open world design and how it's just kind of like different and it allows you to go and do what you're interested in. And this just kind of like builds. I feel like this as a mechanic and like as a principle of this game just like builds on the concept of open world <laughs> games itself. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, it blows it open even further. Like it reminds me yeah. of some of the excitement going back to like the first day of decay, which I know was pretty uneven at launch, but everyone's like, ah, there's so much in there. That's fascinating. And it's fun to see an open world game put systems first. So like the last time there was a yeah. cha big change with the open world genre was like just the invention of it. And now having this new layer of, okay, you can recruit anybody feels it's just so fun to see people excited about this radical change. But Leo, are you annoyed by some of the other uh, criticism out there? Like, I think it's like 76% on Metacritic right now for the PC version. You think it's fair? What do you think people are dinging this game for? I don't know. I I don't think they're wrong for giving it an 8 out of 10. That's kind of what I expected. But because it's like not a perfect game, even for what it tries to do, mm -hmm. it's not perfect. And if that's how you're judging a game, like things in the system, the weird, weird oversights like the deep profiler not working once you've recruited someone. You can't like look at their schedule once they're in your team. So you lose access to like all their connections and everything. Oh, weird. like something that would make the system more interesting, which is weird because it is still working behind the scenes. Like I swapped to an operative who was mourning at the same place he used to mourn before I recruited him, like where I went and found him, Huh. which was weird. But, um, and there's definitely emergent breaking stuff of like, I've got two brothers here and I've recruited one. I'm playing as one brother talking to the other brother and the other guy is barely acknowledging me. And then I bump him and then he's suddenly listed as attempting to hide from <laughs> his brother because he's like turned hostile. There's, it's definitely not a perfect system. And I think it's very easy to poke holes in. And I think that's kind of just where numbered scores kind of fall short in describing this game, really. Like it's going to be so amazing for some people. And so meh for others for sure yeah do you think it's going to be near the top of your game of the year list do you have any sense so far 24 hours in definitely if not number one then top three but i don't see how it's not number one that's amazing i love how you just leaned right into it like not only streaming your entire experience or the first 12 hours at least of the game but then also setting it on hard and setting it on permadeath like, that is such a cool, confident move, Leo, just to go all in. I'm like, I'm going to take this as seriously as I possibly can. Permadeath, no question I wanted it on. Like, I wish that was mandatory, but I understand your 
marketing a game and you can't, that would put off a lot of people probably. Yeah. But difficulty, you can always change, which made me feel good about it. But I'm still playing on hard. It's like the stealth is still fine. It's just when you get detected, probably five, four out of five times you're going to die. But when you don't, it feels amazing. Yeah. So I've been enjoying playing on hard still. <laughs> yeah, it works out. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you saw this uh, headline out there, but talking about the system being a little bit less than perfect, people were alarmed that like there's a description of one character who's a pediatrician and then like the description it says they ended a personal relationship with their patient recently mm-hmm. so everyone's like what is going on is there pedophilia in the mm-hmm. world of watchdogs i guess it's just the random description being slammed <laughs> together it's so absurd yeah. the write-up i saw of that was making a much bigger deal of that and was like we're sure this is going to get patched immediately and it's like who cares like it's it's a throwaway flavor text like you're not going to run into the kid on the street and then there's going to be serious drama from that or anything like that. It's <laughs> hey, there could be a side him. mission. <laughs> if you want to recruit that kid, you have to go beat up the pediatrician. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I don't think pedophiles around the world are celebrating about like, we've got one in a video game. Yeah. <laughs> Hurrah. And then that's the protagonist for everybody. Uh, God, I was surprised. I jumped into the stream randomly, I think, Leo. Yours after, you know, I watched you play the first two and a half hours or whatever. But um, I jumped in afterwards, and this is a deep cut, but John Oliver used to have a podcast called The Bugle that I listened to every episode of back in like 2007, 2008, Um, and his co-host, Andy Zaltzman, was uh, in the game. I guess uh, he does like a a podcast or he's on a radio show or something in that game. The podcasts in Watch Dogs are so fun. Or the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I've only heard one, but I was really impressed. I was like, I'm just going to drive around and listen to this podcast now, I guess. <laughs> I wish you could listen to them on foot like you yeah. could in Watch Dogs 2, the MP3 player. Like, that's something that feels missing from this game for sure. They have so many long podcasts that you have to just like sit in the menu and listen to or happen to catch while you're driving. What? Yeah, yeah. I- I, I was surprised by that. Like that first little area you go in, there's there are headphones everywhere, and every you know I like have been meticulously always have to get everything when you know something like that pops up, and it's it's that basic kind of you know dialogue transcript thing that so many games have, but most of them are in podcast format, and I was surprised by how long some of them were, or most of them were like they're, but yeah, having to I didn't sit there in a menu to listen to all of them. That's that seems That's insane that you can't listen to that on foot. Like, what are they doing? Yeah. It seems right. that seems like something they would patch. Right. Yeah. Obviously, Be- got- before before the pediatrician fiasco. Right. Probably. Right. Yeah. It's a list of priorities. It's tricky to get right. Yeah. Um, any other takeaways from Watch Dogs Legion, Leo? It's cool. <laughs> I, I'm glad Ubisoft did it. I feel like they've got, us, got such a bad rap for a long time over their open world. It's not that bad a rap. They're doing fine. But, you know, it's repetitive. Every Ubisoft game is the same, towers or whatever. And I think it's cool that they tried something that really nobody else has tried outside of like State of Decay and things like that. But still, it is definitely bringing something new to the table that you could only do with Ubisoft's resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Daniel Montes wrote in just to open community questions first. Uh, and this is all just a backdoor, so I can get to an interesting fact at the end. But anyways, Daniel writes in, and he says, hey, with the release of Watch Dogs Legion, the futuristic leap Ubisoft has made with the franchise, where does Watch Dogs go now? Same time period, new city, far future space stuff with planets? What do you want? Oh, and hmm. then also, um, while you think about that, Leo, Daniel says, love from Panda Hands. I guess that's his Discord name. And then he says this, Jeff, um, P.S., a group of pandas is called, do you know this, what a group of pandas is called? It's called an, em- an embarrassment. <laughs> an embarrassment <laughs> of pandas. There was just an embarrassment of pandas in that <laughs> At least three. But yes, Leo, what would you like from the future of Watch Dogs at this point? I mean, it's so much about hacking. It's got to be deeper in the future. Yeah. Right, if anything. But hopefully more dystopic. I feel like it's set, supposed to be set in a dystopia. They wrote it to be a dystopia four years ago. And now it's like, yeah, I'd rather live in this world for sure. <laughs> So <laughs> That's probably a, go harder on that. day now. Yeah. I'm curious to see how like story-wise, world building wise, it sort of uh, mirrors cyberpunk because I feel like there are a lot of common themes. Like as I was, you know, starting the game, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm interested to see how these games will treat like these themes of like government corruption and like right. fun tech, like sort of like differently. Um, and 
more or less similarly. And if there's one that, you know, has something more distinct to say than the other, they'll kind of match up. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see for sure. Yeah. I was worried when they delayed it, that they were going to be past cyberpunk just for general cyberpunk enthusiasm from gamers and however much money they want to spend on cyberpunk stuff. But luckily they got out delayed. Hey, there we go. Uh, hey, Leo, uh, a game was released in early access and uh, Steam loves it. It's it's that early access experience sitting in an overwhelmingly positive on Steam right now. Uh, Teardown, which I'm trying to remember where it was revealed. It was some Jeff Keighley stream months back. And this is a game that's all about destruction. I guess you could and call thievery. it. Yeah, it looks like uh uh minecraft with much finer detail you know we streamed it for the great goatee hunt you can check it out on the youtube channel or the archive on twitch uh and i think it, i said there it looks like what you'd imagine minecraft 2 would look like where it's minecraft with much smaller voxels for blocks here and then uh, a lot of depth of field and lighting effects and the water looks great and all that stuff uh mm. but the internet seems to be loving teardown leo what do you think about it so far it's really cool. It's like the whole pitch is the interesting destruction physics, right? The yeah. fact that you can destroy nearly anything with a variety of different tools and bring down whole buildings or tip over light poles and run on them. But then the actual gameplay is like you have these three objectives and you need to, for a lot of missions, you need to plan out a route between them because you do the first objective, it's going to start a timer. So you like knock down this pole so you can go up to this window and you bash through that window and make sure this door is open and you chart a path to this vehicle, which you can drive over to here. And it's about like playing. It's a it's a really clever way of gamifying playing with the destruction. Yeah, because it has a sandbox mode, which is great. And I'm sure it's what the developer started with. This is Tuxedo Labs that developed this. But then you get to that point of, well, what's the game? And then it's like, oh, it's kind of a heist game for some missions or these kind of, you know, timed experiences you're running through. And so the crazy thing is you have like a can of spray paint and you're like painting a path along the ground. So you remember where to run once you have to get from one spot to the other, as you're blasting your way through this. But uh, Jeff, um, as a fan of red faction gorilla, I feel like you need to check out tear down at least like the great goatee hunt archive. Cause it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. I had seen videos of it and it, it definitely looked super cool. And, and you guys are answering the big question that I had of, is this just kind of a cool tech demo or is there, you know, at least some game structure to it behind it? So yeah, definitely more structure than I was anticipating. If you like the part in red faction gorilla where a the whole building would stay up by just one little corner of a structural support, you're going to love tear down. Cause that happens a lot. It's like, what is the last thing holding up this entire building right now? <laughs> How have you noticed the uh, levels changing, the mission objectives and stuff? Has it gotten more complex as you've gone on? Uh, it's, it did in the Goatee Hunt. I haven't played it much more past that, actually. Okay. But yeah, I, I, it's, you can see how it gets challenging, especially with the secondary objectives of like 60 seconds to go around this giant map. You know, you can press tab at any time to do this big overhead view where you'll see your spray paint route. Like you'll see the route you have planned, but so you can cool. just tell how massive those maps are and how massive they could get. It, it just feels so satisfying on a strange level to have this level of destruction in a game like it feels like we should have had big experiences like this in video games before but even just leo is driving around some giant boat and like ramming it through a bridge and seeing that happen like you can't help but laugh and it's so weird that in 2020 we can see that and be like oh this feels like something new from the video game industry it's so crazy to feel this new feeling I will also yeah, say it's like these small city environments where every building is real and you can bash through the wall and go inside it and it's furnished and everything. Yeah. Like that's something that feels natural when you're doing it, but so few games do that where mm -hmm. you can go in every interior in this whole location. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That I, I have had, that was like my first feeling with Red Faction Guerrilla where it's like, oh man, the future of video games is going to be so cool. And then like no other games ever, ever did it, which, you know, <laughs> clearly it was very hard for them to actually do that, turns out. But yeah, yeah the, I wish, you know, they wish released more games played with that. Red Faction Armageddon, you know, that whole lighting mechanic, yeah. underground. Yeah, let's, you know. let's do that, but take it, take it into smaller caves where, <laughs> instead of big open world thing. That's what everyone wanted. Oh God. But yeah, I remember visiting Volition for the Saints Row 3 cover story trip and they were talking a lot about, and they've talked about it publicly, obviously, but just what a pain in the ass Red Faction Guerrilla was. That it was like seven years of tech just to get that thing up and running. And so I think having this kind of Minecraft-y vibe to it like Teardown does is a, maybe a good shortcut not to try and make it seem super realistic here. But uh, sure. Teardown, it is on Steam right now, early access. Uh, there's no workshop support yet but people are 
uh, champing at the bit to see what they can do with this game and mod it in some fun ways. So it's going to have a fun life in front of it. And plus, it, I'm sure it's a race between Microsoft and Sony to see who can get this on the console first. Because if I saw this on a console, I would think this is like, oh, here's an example of next gen. But it's just mm-hmm. available now in early access on Steam. For sure. I will say there are mods available. It's just only through third party sources oh, for now you can't right. do it right through steam okay gotcha there we go uh leo also kyle was um screaming at you i thought rudely he's out of line uh to check out due process yeah which it's up there for lamest game names of 2020 but it's it's a tactical first person shooter yeah it's a play on how you're not giving due process to these uh, criminals you're executing ah it's like just cause. Uh, yeah exactly uh, yeah, it's kind of like the promise of Siege. It's a 5v5 tactical shooter where you have the planning phase and you're drawing on a map beforehand. You're pointing, let's go in through this door. You two blow this door. You two go around and come through here. And that adds so much. It's so fun. It's more like CSGO in some ways than uh, Siege, though. Like, you have kind of a limited pool of guns. If you take three breaches for the first round, you don't have them the next two rounds. It's really... All tactics, less on the gunplay than Siege, for sure. Like, not p- quick peeking and crouch spamming and stuff. That's not as effective here, for sure. Yeah, so but I, I really love the drawing on the map. Like, there was one point where I was... I just killed the last person, and the time was ticking down on the, the bomb to defuse it, and the guy who... You can't spectate people. You can only view the overhead map and kind of see where they're moving around when you're dead. So the guy was like, bomb's this way, because I didn't know how to get through it. I was going through a wrong door. And he was like, it's this way. And I saw this line appear on the ground and he drew an <laughs> arrow through the whole map to pointing to the bomb and then guided me there. That's awesome. Does it feel a little janky? Is the gunplay okay? The gunplay is okay. That is how I would describe it. It's okay. a little janky. It is early access. Um, yeah, but again, it's like kind of gives it a level playing field for the shooting. I'd still rather it be good shooting, but it's still more like I found this person was here i flash banged and knew where they were and moved in smartly and got a good angle on him versus i just like crouch spammed harder yeah and shot him in the head more that emphasis on tactics it makes me think back to like the original pitch with rainbow six patriots before it was turned into siege and that was much more about like okay you have a meeting room where you're gonna look at the board and actually map out things and who's going where and how this thing's breaking down do you think Rainbow Six Siege is just past that at this point? Like, could they incorporate anything from due process into the game? I don't think they would. Yeah. I think Siege has has found its identity at this point. Because it's it's like twice as long, or three times as long, of a planning phase in due process. And then two-thirds as long rounds, like two-minute rounds. And I don't think Siege would go back. I think they like how they've found uh, the kind of more twitchy shooter fans, in addition to the people who like the tactics of it. Yeah. They're awesome. going to stay in that sweet spot. The other interesting thing about due process is it is like procedurally generated maps. So they're handpicked by the developers, but out of procedural generation. The whole point being, there's no such thing as map knowledge. In Siege, you have to memorize every map. You'll get killed from a bull S angle and you'll say, well, I have to look out for that next time and then it won't happen next time. Yeah. But this one, it's like, it's too many maps to ever memorize. It's 120 right now and 20 are being added every week. 20 maps, all from similar tile sets, so you kind of recognize the rooms, but they're always in a different order, which I think is a really another interesting way to make it a level playing field of having map knowledge not be a thing. Yeah. Is this just a weird novelty? You think you're going to keep playing due process? Uh, depends on if my friends keep playing it, as a lot of these tactical games go. Uh, it is kind of a novelty right now, but I am glad to have it in my library and see as it gets updated reasons to come back. When they add customization and everything, there's barely a leveling system. It just adds one number next to your name per match you play at this point. In some ways, isn't that all we're looking for? That seems seems fun. Cut down to the core of it for sure. (laughs) Watch the number go up, everybody. Uh, Cool. That's due process on Steam. Uh, Jeff Markiafava. Hello. That's me. Uh, (laughs) Are you still enjoying your Nintendo Switch? I am. Uh, is it really a situation where I'm you're getting, like cradling the baby in one hand and then trying to like play a switch at every downtime you can? No, no. But uh, there, there was one point where I kind of had, you know, baby was up here sleeping and I had it in front of me and I was playing Hades and his eyes started focusing on it. And I was like, okay, we'll just move this up behind <laughs> your head. Instead. Yeah. You, you can't know, show him a sexy tree at age one month. Yeah. It'll really mess with his head. 
not good. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I, I have been playing that more, you know, despite having Watchdog Legions now and uh, like a dragon, like I still have gotten more play in with the Switch because it's just so much easier to grab it in the 20 minute gaps that i have to actually play something right right uh and you checked out part-time ufo which is that game from how laboratories that was on ios a couple years back maybe last year and then they released it on switch now and it's a super cheap little game from the kirby creators yeah yeah and i have played played way too much of it (laughs) because of just that thing where it's like okay nice five minute chunk of really fun cutesy kind of goofy gameplay that's basically just you know the claw hook machine from arcades and stuff yeah it's turning that into a a really goofy game where you're stacking up different objects into towers and trying to load a bunch of weird looking vegetables onto you know the back of some farmer's truck and they they just kind of walk you through all these goofy scenarios yeah, uh, like the one on those different missions. Alien. Yeah, I played it on yeah. iOS, and I remember like the soundtrack in particular is just nutso. It's like chibi bluegrass is the best way I would describe it. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, are you enjoying it though? Yeah, I am. Um, it's the, like each each level kind of adds just enough variety to keep you going from one to the next, and there's there's. Each one also has a couple different objectives that you're trying to get. You're trying to get them all at the same time. And so that adds just enough variety there. And it, and it's, I don't think I would want to play it as, you know, just like touchscreen controls on a phone or something. It's nice yeah. having the joysticks and really being able to finally maneuver, even though your spaceship is not the kind of thing that you, like it is clunky and you are picking up these big, heavy pieces and just barely trying to float them into a position and drop them in. But it's that is a kind of a satisfying, very quick game loop. And, you know, for ten dollars or whatever it is like that, it's a it's a great addition to have on my switch. Yeah. So it was made by like a subset of Hal Laboratories. I think they had a label that they called Hal Egg to release more experimental projects. And I love Nintendo Studios, Nintendo centric studios creating these weird things, you know, like Game Freaks, experimental games, even though Towns wasn't great. Uh, Small Town Hero, is that what the game was eventually called? Um, but even just like Intelligent Systems and Pushmo. And this one's interesting because it's like, okay, and, you know, they also, the same team also made, you know, Box Box Boy. But I like them creating this part-time UFO, trying to release it on iOS. You know, it, it's fine. And now it seems like it's caught this new audience once it's absorbed back in the Nintendo monolith. And now Nintendo can be like, hey... Look at this cool little game from the Kirby creators. You know, it's, everything comes back to Nintendo no matter what. Yeah, and, and it, it definitely feels like a very, very concentrated Nintendo experience that you can get in a matter of minutes. Like just the, you know, very simple gameplay, but just the entire aesthetic. And like you said, the music and everything just feels so classically kind of Nintendo, up Nintendo's alley that, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice, fun, definitely family friendly little experience yeah part-time ufo is that one um anna how you doing good okay (laughs) i feel like you've been quietly uh, and patiently watching us for a while oh no well it's it's always hard because like i feel like the stuff that i'm excited for is a little later on even though i'm obviously excited about everything yeah including i'm most i am excited that jeff got a switch um and I was sort of thinking about other games that I like to play in like five minute spurts, like what what would fall into that? Because I've been yeah, playing I'll, a lot of games like that recently. I'll take I'll take any recommendations that people have, because that's that's been a a blessing for in terms of actually getting to play video games for the past two or three weeks. Yeah, you played Stardew Valley, right? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. If you ever want to Break open that seal again yeah. on Switch. Like, it's that good bite-sized thing. Just do a day whenever yeah. you get a chance. Yeah, yeah and for sure. The Stardew Valley Switch experience, it's like it's like Stardew was made for Switch. For sure. Um, like, I started Stardew on my PC, enjoyed it, but didn't get super into it. Maybe played, like, I don't know, three or four hours. Sure. But now it's, like, I think it's, like, my third most played game on my Switch. Um, yeah, I believe it. It's, yeah. It's so perfect. It's the best. <laughs> so perfect. I'll... I'll open that floodgate at some point again. Uh, <laughs> once the once the Hades flood, you know, dies down yeah. a little bit, which th- that could take a while. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, people in the backstage past watching us live at the $10 tier. Uh, Bob Buell in particular is screaming, Jeff, um, would love Mario 35. Did you, do you have like the Nintendo online thing? Do you, did you download I, Mario 35? I haven't, I haven't ripped off that band aid yet, but yeah. I'm sure that and Tetris 99 seem like fun, goofy little experiments. Oh, that- oh Jeff, um, you gotta <laughs> Which, play Tetris well, 99. Well, I, I still have, I have Tetris, uh, Puyo Puyo. It's the best. From because I, I reviewed it at Game Informer and they had sent a digital code for it, and I wisely added it on my own, you know, email address, thinking maybe someday this could come in handy. <laughs> and so still have access to that one. It's God, it's just the best. But you gotta get competitive yeah. with that. Like going through that campaign for Puyo Puyo Tetris, I mean, come on. No, yeah. no, no, good. no. You have good. to do the local co-op. And then Puyo Puyo. Tetris 2 is coming out, right? Yeah, it is, but it's the oh. thing of like, well, who knows uh, when? Yeah, Puyo Puyo and Tetris are already perfect on Puyo Puyo Tetris 1. I, I don't know why I would yeah. ever check yeah. it out. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Jeff, and please train up and then we can uh, compete in Tetris at some point, please. Do we? Okay, great. Um, okay, Leo, there is a game. This is, this is why I like you, Leo, because a lot of people will say, oh, I could talk about this game on the podcast, and you come out swinging and say, I could talk about this game called Dear Reader, or I could just reveal it once it's on my top 10 <laughs> game of the year list. High praise, <laughs> dude. Yeah, that felt, I, after I, re- I read that back and it felt a little manipulative, so I apologize <laughs> about that. Well, we have no choice, so now we're here talking about Dear Reader? Yeah, this is an Apple Arcade game. My, my go-to phone game, West Game, which is some weird free-to-play garbage that was fine, yeah. that I played for like six months. It wasn't bringing me joy. Hit that sweet delete and then wanted to check out what's been happening in Apple Arcade, you know, since there wouldn't be microtransactions or anything. Try some pure gaming experiences on my phone in my free time since I'm not trying to be on Twitter either. Mm -hmm. So if people are looking to be relaxed on their phone nowadays, which might interest people, I definitely recommend Dear Reader. It came out last month and the whole pitch is like it takes these public domain uh, classic books your Moby Dicks, your Prides and Prejudices, your Littles and Women's. <laughs> and it trims them down into like 40 short chapters, like a super what? abridged version of this book that'll still tell you most of the story. And you'll certainly get the gist of whether you like the book or not, like you'll understand how it's written. But what it does then is it gives you a different puzzle for each chapter what? Of, a, of up to like 30 different kinds of puzzles where it'll like take out four words and yeah. put four words at the bottom and you'll have to arrange them, you know, from the word bank or just like Jeopardy style putting letters in that fill in the gaps in all the words in the paragraph. And it's just like a way of active reading of these books that I find so interesting. And it's oh. so cool that it's like actual real books that I've always thought I should read. And I've at least gotten the gist of like, well, Moby Dick seems like it's not for me. Not into the writing style. I, there's this book called The Yellow Wallpaper that I'd never heard of that is about like this woman who gets obsessed with the, her hideous wallpaper. And there's just chapter after chapter describing the pattern of this wallpaper. And I <laughs> completely fell in love with it. This book I'd never heard of. And uh, I think it's it's so, yeah, it's been really compelling to me, but like a relaxing way to spend my time before bed and stuff. I played that a really early version of it before it even had a name at GDC like in 2018, 2019, something like that. And it was, it's, it's so pleasant. Um, But then also I, my immediate thought was like, wow, if, you know, they got this into schools, this like, this could be a great actual tool for learning. Cause I think I like read some scenes from Hamlet or something. And it was like, actually making me think about the word choice and you know pay more attention to the language but in a way that was like not overly draining you know because sometimes when you read some of those classics they're so bulky and so meaty that this game just kind of cuts to the heart of it and like the dev is like studied english and so kind of like they were very intentional about how they picked the selections for the game and i thought that was really cool it's almost like you know, having a professor be like, these are the most important pages of this story. Like, you don't need to spend hours and hours and hours reading it. You can just read through this part, through this yeah. app. <laughs> yeah. That's such a fun idea. I think I might sign back up for Apple Arcade just to play Is this. It, Leo, do you know if it's only on Apple Arcade now? I couldn't find it anywhere else. I looked up to make sure before this and I didn't Dude. see anything. 
Yeah, yeah. it seems like it's just Apple Arcade. And it seems like it might have come out last year, Leo. So uh, you're out of your mind if you put it on your top 10 list this year. Oh, I thought it was October of this year. I don't know. Maybe there's an update. There's articles about it from last year, at least. But no, you can still put it on your top 10, of course. Personal top 10, <laughs> it's game on, anything goes. The official right. two tens, though, that's a, that's a real debate. Uh, but I will say just the gamification of it is really strong. Like there are goals you're going for and every chapter and how well you do will earn you ink and then you save up ink to buy more books. And that's a really compelling loop to be in because as you get more books, you like open up more ways to complete the research challenges. There's a lot to it. I really like it. Weird. Yeah. Dear reader. That's a cool one. Uh, well, thank you, Leo, for making us all smarter and better. <laughs> my pleasure getting better you. hey yeah hey there we go uh oh yep you're right dear reader the unauthorized autobiography of kim jong il released january 25th 2014 <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> great leo all right we're gonna clap on out of here we'll see you at extra life this weekend yeah woo surreal vasquez as i live and breathe that's, that's me welcome uh people in the backstage pass uh discussion chat here uh they're asking how's nebraska because you're back in Nebraska for a while. Yeah, it, it was actually um, 80 degrees yesterday, which is very strange for November. Uh, but a lot of things are strange right now. It's so weird. I'm with you. Like yesterday, my girlfriend got home. She's like, it's 75 degrees out. And I was like, there is no scientific way that's possible. And I was really cocky. I'm like, you're telling me if I take out my phone right now and open the weather app, it'll say 75 degrees. And I opened it and it said exactly 75 degrees. <laughs> what the hell is going on? It's Minnesota in November for Christ's sake. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting week. And uh, I'm planning on Friday just going out and going on a big hike. The weather's nice. It'll be nice just to unpack, unwind a little bit. Um, but let's talk right now about Yakuza 7, or Yakuza Like a Dragon, as it's called, in the West. Uh, we've all been playing it, yes? Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Um, I, uh, maybe four or five hours in. Uh, Surreal, how much have you played? I'm about 15 hours in. Okay. I've, I've been, that, that has been like what I've been mainlining this week. Oh, perfect, yeah. Uh, it seems like it's, what, 40 hours or so for the for the main game here yeah it's, it's pretty beefy it's i mean it's an rpg right it is well, an rpg now yeah. yeah so the big thing with yakuza like a dragon is new protagonist and they got rid of the brawler combat and now it is a turn-based rpg mm -hmm. but still with the presentation of the brawler uh surreal i have never gotten into a yakuza game before i've tried zero and six and i liked it but i think part of it was the combat was a turnoff and loving old school turn-based rpgs i freaking love this game it is yeah. just surreal and bizarre and wonderful in a way that I did not expect. And it seems so lame to, in 2020, be like, hey, what the hell? Yakuza's really good. I feel like everybody had the realization <laughs> back with Yakuza Zero, but it is just clicking for me now. They're like, this is such a magical, weird thing. Uh, where's everybody else at with this game? Um, I've really been enjoying it. I think I'm like 10 hours-ish in. It's been such a gift to play um, that game this week, I would yeah. say. Um, and it might be my goatee. Wow. Like, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 I love this game so far. Have you played any of the other ones? No. <laughs> so I think, okay, I'm so glad that I'm in the exact same camp as you then. Cause I feel like, oh, I want to make all these video essays and have these bold thoughts, but it's like, wait, no, I, I read that think piece years ago in Yakuza Zero. Like, that's well trodden territory of just like, holy cow, this is good. But Jeff, I'm trying to remember how much Yakuza you've played before. Yeah, I I kind of had that epiphany maybe like two games ago, um, but I I'm only I'm only like maybe two hours into this one. Okay, uh, but I do I do like the switch to turn based combat a lot more than I thought I would. I thought that was going to be weird and really slow things down but so far um that's been that's been cool uh yeah i'm 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 still waiting to unlock the mahjong game is there is there mahjong in this one surreal i don't know if there's mahjong but i've definitely seen uh what i what's their equivalent of chess called show shogi shogu shogi shogi yeah they, they have that in there Okay. And you can I play with a random guy that's sitting on a, on like a, a random building. So he's just like, I'm just an old man. If you want to play some shogi. <laughs> yeah. Usually my experience with Yakuza is I'll play like a dozen hours, like all the systems and then get to the Mahjong part and just play way too much Mahjong and then burn <laughs> out the rest of the <laughs> You nerd. Be I'll because it's hard to find like an actual 
like traditional mahjong game like on your phone and stuff it's always the you know matching puzzle game yeah like like actual either it's either that or it will be in japanese or chinese and and so it's like hard to navigate all the menus and stuff but they have always done a very nice distilled version of actual mahjong and taught it well um in the yakuza game and you think we'll get back to reviewing yakuza like a dragon in a bit but you think mahjong is that good of a game like my mom recently took mahjong classes and she's like it rules it's actually really cool yeah yeah it, it is super cool it's it's kind of it kind of has the hook of poker except instead of you know five different hands that you can get there's like 30 and and a lot of them are super obscure and it's a really weird tense waiting game as you're getting tiles and trying to build up to different hands and then halfway through you're like well that's probably not going to happen anymore what else can i make out of this hand and but but the the rules are really kind of hard to wrap your head around and so it helps to have a game like yakuza where they do a good job of explaining you know kind of more of the intricacies and stuff yeah, but I don't know if it's if it's actually in this one or not. So, <laughs> so it's highly irrelevant. I was <laughs> that may not be like, relevant. But like but. at the start screen, I was amazed that they have oh here's Virtual Fighter five and two and two point one. If you just want to play mm-hmm. this, like it's so fun mm-hmm. to see them just embrace Sega's back catalog. And then with the entire framing of this game, I love seeing cross publisher love and seeing Sega really kiss square enix or enix ass with the amount of dragon quest love that's in this game because the main character this time around ichiban is a huge dragon quest fan and it's not like some dragon quest offshoot or him trying to come like say that he loves this game that is supposed to be dragon quest but they can't actually say dragon quest i love they just lean into it and it's him just talking about how much he loved dragon quest and every character is just like oh here we go with this dragon quest stuff again and then it frames everything like he says every time he fights it feels like he's in a dragon quest battle and then the entire menu even is just like an old rpg with like gear and party every time somebody joins your party it has like an old school jrpg celebration sound it feels on a like a very expensive version of Earthbound at times. Yeah, that's. I I know that um you know that this game is very different from the rest of the series, but I was like I had this image in my mind. I was like, wow, like I want to recommend this to all Earthbound fans, like all sort of like offbeat RPGs folks who are into sort of like indie RPGs that are trying something new. Yeah. Um, because it's like even in the storytelling, like it just has so much, or like the side quests, it shares like kind of that uh, quirky, uh, very like loving spirit. Um, and is is a very similar experience <laughs> to playing Earthbound. Yeah, I, yeah, that quirkiness is the part that I cannot wrap my mind around, that a game can do everything so well. It feels like a parody of a Japanese game at times. And the fact that it like, works as well as it does as this wacky experience where it's like this mini game where you're picking up cans on a bike and you get a boost and then like having this whole JRPG framing and yet every time it gets serious with the storytelling I am 100% there and I think there's some really affecting characters and moments in this in a way that I did not expect because again I'm an idiot when it comes to the series yeah I think one of the like the the takeaways that I'm having is that it does even feel tonally different from uh, Yakuza games but I think it manages to keep what the series does so well which is like being it they it, those games have always felt like deeply sympathetic to almost all of its characters where you'll have like um sort of GTA style quest where it's like here's a here's kind of this really weird guy like early on you meet this guy who uh, he talks about like, oh, I've, I'm a hoarder because like I'm a hoarder and I'm clogging up the street with all the stuff that I'm hoarding. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this guy's kind of in my way. And then, you know, like, no, I don't want to spoil anything, but like eventually you learn like a, a kind of a, like a heartfelt backstory about this guy that makes you sympathize with them. And that's what they end up doing with so many of their characters where it's not like a GTA thing. Like, oh, look at this weirdo. You're just good. Like this guy's taking you on a, on a, on a crazy thing. And you're just kind of like, uh, I guess I'll hop off this weirdo. And every everything ends up being really um, kind of deeply sympathetic, um, but it also feels like it is commentating uh, on like a lot of the themes of Yakuza in a different way because this is basically a retelling in a way of the first Yakuza game. Oh, really? Because um, well, not like expl- not like super, but like the premise is basically the same. Yeah, I feel like they do such a great job of putting this character that is likable and strange in a really compelling situation right and it's like i i do mm-hmm. want to see how he gets out of this it like it does such a great job in the beginning of setting that hook story-wise and i'm curious like there's a lot of stuff that like i'm not i'm not confused playing this it, it does a good job for newcomers if you're new to the series but there's definitely moments of like 
oh, like the history of the different clans and stuff. I'd imagine that's such a huge part of Yakuza. Like, it does playing those previous games help inform in a big way? Like, okay, they're talking about the rivalry rivalry between yeah. the clans, so that's like the core of Yakuza. Like, which clan was Kiryu in? So he, uh, Kiryu was in like the Tojo clan, basically, okay. like the huge overarching clan, right? And the, the one you're met, you're kind of. Uh, more familiar with in this one is the Omi clan, which is the clan from Kanto, which was in Yakuza Kiwami 2. Okay. Uh, and so they're, they're kind of like the the other big clan that is on the other side of the country. So that's where you end up because this game takes place in Yokohama, which is not, you know, Kamurocho, which is the, the, the place where the city, this game has always taken place in. Um, so th- there are those parallels there, but I think... I think for the most part, there haven't been like this explicit, like if you don't understand what, you know, this thing, this plot line from Kiwami, you're not going to know what's going on. The main thing I'm confused about is every once in a while, there's like a subtle nod when Ichiban introduces himself and people are like, what? Your name's Ichiban? Like, it seems like that name means something that doesn't quite get translated, but they couldn't translate the main yeah. character's name. Am I missing so, like, something there? I think the literal translation of Ichiban is like the best or number one, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, thank so, you. Sorry. I mean, Jeff. I'm so sorry. people are just like, that's a really weird name for someone to have. And I think it's not like hyper weird for Japan. I think a lot of, a lot of naming, um, a lot of names, I think have a lot to do with numbers. Like, you know, Suda Goichi, uh, Goichi Suda is 51. I like, right. That's oh, what they really? call it. Suda 51. Goichi is five one. I had no idea. Uh, so like, so it's not that crazy, but it, it, I guess people in Japan think that's a kind of a weird name. Okay. That uh, explains it. Yeah. And, and, and like, he is this weird, more rambunctious version of Kiryu. Like his cut, colors are literally inverted because Kiryu has like a red shirt and a white suit, whereas he has a red suit and a white shirt. Uh, and they're kind of, they have this running commentary on like, this guy's very different. Like we don't want to even want to compare him to Kiryu, uh, because like Kiryu was this very like almost uh, quiet uh, Captain America kind of like you look to him uh, for all of the, the moral answers that this game poses questions with, right? Like it's like Kiryu will always do the right thing and Ichiban's kind of figuring out how to do that, uh, which makes it his origin story. Yeah, and I love even just the, the weird note uh, towards the beginning of the game when he gets like a haircut and then he's like, oh, this hair is terrible. And it's like the big joke is how terrible his haircut is. But that's just like his haircut in the, the game. Then. It's like the marketing yeah. haircut. Like the fact that this protagonist can have a haircut that he also thinks is stupid. Like, I don't think that's ever happened in a video game before. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Yeah. Well, it, it's it, almost like, you know, he had big shows to fill with Kiryu. But the game, the writers were just like, hey, we're just going to get a completely different pair of shoes. <laughs> like, <laughs> just make it yeah. completely different. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That that has been what has stood out to me. And, and I'm, like I said, I'm very early in it. And so I've been waiting for some kind of big shift, which you guys have been talking about a little bit. But it, he, he so far has felt more like a, you know, sidekick npc in one of the yakuza games like like the the very weird kind of goofy character as opposed to the main character who's going to get it get done and be really stoic you know it like the the kind of things like you you go to get peking duck with your boss and and the the you know the restaurant is closed and he's sitting shaking a a paper sign and yelling you have to open for us because we want this peking duck so much it's like (laughs) What do you what do you think the sign is gonna do? Like he he is such a goofy <laughs> character, at least in those first opening hours, that it's it has definitely felt like a very different uh, experience. But yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I, interested yeah. in seeing where it goes from there. Uh, yeah, you, I think. What, oh, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna ask, um, what language everybody's playing in? Like, I started in English, and then pretty quickly, I was like, ah, I gotta go Japanese. It just feels it feels wrong to be playing this in English, even though I think it's lip synced for both. Like yeah, they have, they have they have uh, in English, which th- they did with Judgment uh, as well. Which I think I think it works okay. I think I, like the biggest kind of turnoff for me with the English is I don't think Kasuga's voice actor like matches the role. I think he's he does a really good job, but I feel like when you compare him to his Japanese counterpart, I feel like he should sound a little bit more gruff. Whereas I think the English actor uh, like sounds a little bit too young for someone who's in, hmm. in their forties. Sure. Um, but other than that, I think the English voice cast, which is what I've been using so far, just cause it's easier to retain story that way for me. Um, I think it is good, but it's weird because it's, you can tell that they pick their moments for when they want voice acting. And a lot of the ambient stuff, even if you're playing in English is in Japanese. Right. 
But I, I guess that doesn't really affect me too much. I'm not because you kind of understand that that game is set in Japan. Yeah. Uh, as much as I'm enjoying it, there's definitely a beat of is it ever gonna cool it with the amount of cutscenes? It has a lot of cutscenes and then run to this nearby location and maybe do a little something and then jump back to cutscenes. Is that just the Yakuza formula and I should deal with it? Because I'm enjoying it, but I do have that question of if it's going to cool it later on. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot of cutscenes, but I think it uh, w- depends. On the, I think on chapter four is when it really opens up and you're kind of given uh, a lot more freedom to do side stories and stuff. Okay. Um, but yeah, those first three chapters where he's uh, uh, basically... You know, uh, he ends up homeless and then he has to figure out like, which is a weird thing to have in an RPG is like, let's all go to the jobs office and then try to figure out like how to get work. Right. Um, right. And he kind of the whole the 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 theme of like, yeah, what because he's kind of very ignorant about that kind of stuff. So he's like, why don't all you bums just get jobs? And they kind of basically tell him like, you know how hard it is to get a job when you don't have a residence and you don't have any work history uh for, for like a, an rpg to tackle that kind of stuff uh i think is really cool like i not something you see in like most games honestly let alone an rpg and that it mixes that with the like bombast of like oh yeah the combat is like there are places where you can kick someone into the street and they'll get hit by a car yeah. uh which is like all and all this bombastic thing of like um your party members like have this tag team attack where it's like really um really just like crazy and, and really fun t- to look at and the fact that it mixes that with like this very subtle like very nuanced approach to storytelling is is like kind of hard to do yeah very adult approach to storytelling as well i've been impressed mm-hmm. just overall there uh the combat i love it just as a fan of turbo rpgs it does feel a little bit it's that problem of it seems like the proximity matters and mm-hmm. where you're at matters but you can't run around freely so I'm trying to think there's got to be a great example of an RPG like this. I'm trying to remember if Star Ocean 2, you could control it. But it's that weird thing of just like, well, now my character happens to be here and now I'm doing the attack and then there was somebody in the way and so it didn't work. Or my character happens to be here. Oh, I guess that was within range of this object. Now I'm going to pick up this bike and beat him with it, which is great. But it feels a little bit mushy and kind of cobbled together in some ways. Yeah, you definitely can't plan for that stuff. You can't, right. you know, like, I think the most you can do is there are certain attacks, uh, like, you eventually recruit, like, a, a guy named the Dachi, and he has this thing where he'll just charge straight for his opponent, and, and anyone in his way he'll also take with him. If you see a group of guys, you're like, okay, I want to I wanna make sure that I tackle them, or, like, there'll be some attacks with that, but you definitely can't plan to kick anybody into traffic. Um, right. So I think I think if you treat them as like, oh, this is a cool bonus versus like, oh, in order, it's not like any, the combat so far hasn't presented any puzzles. Like, oh, you need to make sure you do this and in, in this in order to damage this boss. It's so, it's more like a, a fun kind of flashy bonus than an actual thing you have to strategize. But I do think so far the combat is a little too simple. Yeah, yeah, I kind of have that same takeaway as well, but I don't mind simple combat at times if it's this yeah, throwback yeah. style. Um, but yeah, Yakuza 7, or like a dragon, I guess we should call it. Uh, it's it's awesome. It's coming out um, November tenth. Yeah, with on every system of new except for PS five. The PS five version is coming right. out March twenty. Uh, yeah, March twentieth, twenty twenty one, I believe, something like that. Um, but it, there's a weird hiccup on the PS four version that I'm playing at least. Like before a cutscene starts, it'll have this like this long pause. It, do you guys have that too? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, I haven't gotten it. I'm playing on PC, so I think like the uh, okay. a lot of that stuff is weird, uh, like or pretty short. I'm playing on the PlayStation. I haven't noticed anything. Oh, but do you have a PS4 Pro? PS4 Pro? No, I just have like a oh, regular old yeah. slim. I don't know. I forgot which one. But Standard it's definitely old not a one. Pro. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe it won't be there for next gen, or it's not in other versions, or not even other PlayStation ones. But that's the main tech hiccup that i've noticed so far and you know they released a trailer where it's like oh the next gen features because i think they're really trying to push it even microsoft's trying to push this for being a launch day series x game and it's like it's just a jokey trailer because they're like oh next gen kissing next gen karaoke because it's just it's yakuza like it's gonna look how it looks and it looks Mm -hmm. pretty good but don't expect this to be the next gen show case even showpiece even if it's a great game to play on next gen yeah i mean i keep in mind this game came out in the beginning of the year in japan for ps4 Right. right exactly um, kind of in that same wheelhouse, uh, I've checked out Dirt 5 a little bit, which it's funny to see Microsoft pushing, um, as like, hey, big racing game, you know, when they had the UI showcase for the Xbox Series X, uh, the game that they showed off there was Dirt 5, because you'd think that'd be a Forza game, but they don't have one for this slot, and so they want to show off next gen with a racing game. So I've been playing, uh, Dirt 5 on Steam a bit, and Dirt's one of those series that 
it's just been quietly, maybe not quietly for racing fans, but like it's been reviewing well. Like Dirt 4 is sitting at like 85 on Metacritic, I think. And so far, Dirt 5 is sitting at an 83. Um, but, you know, if you want a racing game to play on your new console, it seems like Dirt 5 is a decent option. Although, recent, realistically, though, like if you have Game Pass, just go play Forza Horizon 4 or 3 because those games are still fantastic. And it's so weird to play a lot of those games and jump to Dirt, Dirt 5 and realize like... Uh, I could kind of use that rewind feature here, but it's still fun to have like a non open world racing game, just race after race. Uh, they have like a whole podcast presentation where Troy Baker is talking a lot. It's an oddly presented game, but Jeff, do you think you'd ever play a racing game again? Um, I, you know, I have actually always liked rally racing games. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are, those have become more my style and I don't, I, I think it's just because I, I don't have the patience to learn, you know, more of a simulation style game. Like I, I am always driving way too fast and always on the verge of being out of control. And that's just what rally racing is. And yeah. so it, it kind of works out that way. Did you play rally sport back on the Xbox from dice? Um, I played one of them that had, I, I think it was named after a rally sport. Oh, Colin racer. McRae or whatever? Yeah, I, th- I think that was the one. Uh, that was the first one that actually got me into rally racing games. And like, I didn't know what they were before then. But. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's Dirt 5. It's out uh, everywhere. Um, well, next gen soon, I guess. Uh, Surreal, have you checked out Visage, the horror game? I haven't. I heard of. I, I've heard a lot of people uh, talk about it, uh, but it seems like it's uh, building on a lot of what PT is kind of putting down early on, right? Very much so. Yeah. So it's a Kickstarter project that just went 1.0 on Steam, um, and we streamed the first hour and a half of it. If you want to check it out on our YouTube channel, Ronnie and I streamed it. Um, very scary, but it just it makes me want to scream because you know you look at like the community vote last week. When it was like, oh, PT is the greatest horror game of all time. And Visage is out there. And it's like, this basically is a full version of PT. And I hope that that PT loving audience finds this because it is right there, ready to go. The developers have done an awesome job. It is scary as hell. Uh, and if you like the vibe of PT of just slowly making progress and locking different areas of this house as things get more and more messed up, uh, Visage seems right up your alley. It's I probably mispronouncing the name, but it's V-I-S-A-G-E. Uh, so please, please check that out if you enjoy PT. I hope that audience finds it and enjoys it. Um, also, last uh, spooky thing to mention here. There is a platformer, a 3D platformer called Pumpkin Jack, which I mm-hmm. saw as just like some jokey thing on Steam. Like, oh, maybe we'll put that as a great goatee hunt option. Uh, it's sitting at overwhelmingly positive on Steam. And so I played through the first hour and a half with Ronnie as well during our Halloween stream. Uh, Just loved it. It is just a great example of just a very smooth, simple 3D platformer where there's nothing that's really going to annoy you. You make progress. It changes things up enough. You get different weapons as you move along. Like if you're nostalgic about 3D platformers, you could do worse than checking out Pumpkin Jack. And the beauty is it's like four to five hours long. And so I played on that stream, and then even though I was loving Yakuza, uh, over the weekend, I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit down and just finish Pumpkin Jack. So I played through all of Pumpkin Jack, and it's so cool. And it kind of like calls back to that larger theme of 2020 just being a surprisingly great year for platformers. I I don't think anybody saw it coming, but at the end of the year, we're going to look back and be like, Jesus, there's a lot of platforming going on this year. Mm -hmm. And I think Pumpkin Jack belongs in that discussion of just the surprisingly good platformers. Is it like a, a Mario 64 kind of platformer? Is it like a 3D world? Like what What? Like what do you think is like the, the closest analog, I think, for people who like those games? I'd say the closest analog is like a medieval. Like even thematically, mm-hmm. it feels a little bit like that. The art kind of looks like a World of Warcraft. Yeah, it's less Kitty and Mario. Like you're working for Satan uh, to take back all these areas mm-hmm. uh, as a animated uh, scarecrow that's what pumpkin jack's all about um and you have a little crow as a buddy so yeah I, somewhere in the medieval realm or even it reminds me of just like that kind of jack and daxter one style platformer just that pretty simple experience here but i don't know if you guys ever had that experience where it's a game that's not going to be in my top 
five for game of the year or anything but at the same time it's like it's just such a smooth piece of game design and there's nothing to stop you so you'll just keep playing it and it's a comfort food of sorts yeah that that's kind of the big pitch for game pass essentially like yeah. there, there have been so many smaller games like that where it's like huh yeah i can i can keep playing this for another nine hours and just because you, you know it's it's not rewriting what video games are in 2020 or anything like that but it's it's pleasant enough and sometimes just kind of having a pleasant distraction that is a short thing that you can get through in a yep. reasonable amount of time is is kind of a blessing oh man yeah so right now pumpkin jack is on everything but if it ever gets on game pass in particular like if they line that for line it up for halloween next year or something yeah check it out but right now it's on switch pc and every console on demand um Okay. Serial, anything else you'd like to say about any topic that we've covered so far? Uh, no, I've just been messing around with the, the new Dota mode, Dire Tide. I think oh, yeah. What is that? Kind of. Uh, so it's like their big holiday mode. They haven't had it, I think, in like seven years, I think, was the last time. Uh, so it's been, it's been kind of a thing that the community has really latched onto. Like, oh, that, like Valve hates us because they won't give us Dire Tide. Mm. Uh, and so now they brought it back, and then you realize that the reason why they brought it back is they figured out how to monetize it. Uh, Interesting. So they've, they've changed the mode a lot because um, it used to take place on the regular Dota map. It was just kind of altered rules, whereas now they've given it its own map and, like, it, a weird um, custom art style where it's like they take the base it's not like super different but they take the base art style and they kind of make it look a little bit more they add like a a cell shaded layer on top of it so it kind of looks like pencil drawings is it the first time that valve has done that for dota i think so Uh, i I don't remember anything like it before um but so like the idea is is sort of like you're instead of uh gold when you kill creeps you get candies and stuff and so like you bank candies and they make you weaker so you want to deposit them in your little stash uh of like it's this giant like trick-or-treat jack-o'-lantern thing in the in in your base but uh if the enemy pushes far enough into your base it can just straight up steal your candy um but like the 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 weird thing about it is that um you get points for playing the, the mode and when you get 100 points you get one of like a bajillion drops there's so many different kinds of things you can get but there are a very limited number of of actual like items that people want to get so it's just like oh here i'm getting another garbage item for having played like seven matches which is kind of weird but yeah like it, this is combined with their stock market stuff where oh if you buy it if you get a set you can sell it on the market and so like right now the four sets that everybody wants are like 200 like the biggest one is the sniper set that makes them look like a, a spaceman yeah uh and that's like 200 dollars if you want to buy it just directly Jesus uh Christ. and all the other ones are like a hundred dollars and so like th- but those are the most rare sets obviously so it's like oh they, they've, they've added this like uh, uh, additional microtransaction hook so this is why they brought it back uh which is kind of like a bummer but like the mode is all right like i played a few matches and i'm i'm into it but is the community just, pissed then or are they happy i think it's it's a uh, i'm happy with the mode but it's like the the fact that they've monetized it this way i think also makes people cr- uh, like weird because people like they've had to fix the mode a few times because there are just interactions with that mode that are broken like there is a character uh, shadow shaman who could just absolutely destroy bases and like he could summon these snakes that are basically invulnerable to most kinds of damage that he just summons them next to the next to your jack-o'-lantern your base and the enemy base and it just dis- completely annihilates the amount of candy you have and so they okay we have to patch it for that but like now people will just take this mode way too seriously because they want more points so they can get more rewards. Right. So it's like, you're, if you're just playing by yourself randomly, you're just being just annihilated by like, Oh, this team composition is completely busted. Uh, and I'm just getting rolled and not having any fun in a mode that should be like, Oh yeah, you're just kind of messing around with the holiday mode, whatever. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a, a mixed bag, but people, yeah. people seem to be digging the mode overall. Okay. Right on. Dire tide Dota two. Anna, have you ever gotten into any MOBAs? Mm-mm. smart smart way to go uh <laughs> hey Correct. anna do you know how this whole thing operates yeah there is this website it's called patreon and we have a profile on it yeah that's right and you can find it it's kind of like a secret shortcut it's mm-hmm. if you go to like that white bar at the top of your browser and you type in patreon.com slash minmax with two n's 
you can find a lot of fun things. And that's how we have this whole operation rolling. So thanks for the support, everybody. Uh, it is a new month, so we're going to be having a new wall of heroes, a uh, new ads to read on the podcast, all that fun stuff, names to say at the end of the podcast. Um, but the payments haven't gone through quite yet on Patreon's end, so it won't be shifting over quite yet. So if you support us at that tier and you're like, hey, where's my Wall of Heroes image? It's coming next week once everything uh, gets locked down on Patreon's end. But thank you to the BAM Box for their support here. Uh, they say, hello, Min Maxers. We are so thankful for the support you've shown us so far. And we're really excited about the box we've been able to get you next. Be sure to reserve your November Gamer Box at thebambox.com and then hit us up on Facebook or Twitter to become part of the BAM community. Thank you, Bam Box. Uh, for November, they have GTA and Ratchet and Clank in their mysterious gamer boxes. But thank you, Bam Box, for all of your support. Also, thank you to I Am 8 Bit for your support. Uh, they want everybody to know that in their wonderful online store, uh, they are selling an Annapurna Interactive Deluxe Limited Edition, which is an awesome bundle for the PlayStation 4. It features Donut County, Goragoa, Kentucky Route Zero TV Edition, Outer Wild, Sayonara, Wild Hearts, Telling Lies, Watam, and What Remains of Edith Finch, one of our favorite games. Uh, and it includes the first physical PS4 release of Telling Lies and Goragoa. It also has an exclusive forward from Annapurna Interactive's founder, Nathan Gary, an exclusive statement from each game's creative visionaries, and it's region free. And there's only 2,000 of these things available, so please check out that awesome Annapurna bundle at I Am 8 Bit Store. And for everything under $100 in that store, you can use a promo code just for MinMax listeners and viewers that'll get you 10% off. And that promo code is, Jeff, I'm it's Thanksgiving. Are you ready for this? Oh, I'm not. The promo code is MinMaxFeast. Ooh. All one word, MinMax Feast for 10% off anything under $100 in that I Am 8-Bit online store. Thank you for the support, I Am 8-Bit. Uh, they are so generous that every week they ship something out from their wonderful online store to the person that wins the question of the week. So if you support us at any tier on Patreon, you can submit a question that we'll answer in the community question segment, and then we'll choose our favorite, and that person will win something amazing from I Am 8-Bit. Uh, this week it is the DJ Sona uh, album from Riot Games. So a sweet vinyl record from I Am 8-Bit and we'll ship that out to our favorite community question. But before we get to community questions, uh, Jeff has to go change what I'd imagine is just a mountain of poop in a diaper at this point. So wow. much poop. <laughs> How's that going? Are you used to changing diapers now? Yeah, you know, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it's, it's not, it's, the first diaper is fine, but when you get a new one on him and then he just immediately craps himself again while staring directly into your <laughs> eyes. And, and then you love. take that one off and then he pees all over the changing table because he also finds that very funny. That's, it's a compounding kind of injury. How long does the cuteness last versus frustration? Like if you had moments of him doing that and you're actually genuinely like, God damn it! Not no, screaming at not your yet. child, but it's, okay. It's pure it, patience you know, now. It, it, it must be an evolutionary thing that children are as cute as they are. And that's, that's why they have survived over these <laughs> centuries because you just look Babies at them. Babies the species. Still, yep. It, you, you look at them and it's like, I can't be mad at you. You're just too cute. That's so. wonderful. Well, uh, go take care of your kid and uh, everybody says bye. All right. See ya. Hello, Charles McGregor. Hello. Welcome, developer of the wonderful game HyperDot, available now on Game Pass, yes? Yes. Yeah, it's on uh, Game Pass, so you can get on Xbox and Windows uh, as Play Anywhere. And then it's also on Steam and Itch. That's right. And then you joined us for the deepest dive on The Last of Us Part Two. That huge discussion. Yes. My God. That was God. a very long discussion. <laughs> it was a beast. Uh, what are you up to these days? What's going on over there? Yeah, so uh, I'm still doing some work on HyperDot stuff, have some really exciting things coming up soon. Uh, and then uh, I'm also now working on uh, or working with We're Five Games with Totally Reliable Delivery Service. So I'm uh, working on making that a lot better and and making like updates and stuff like that. Oh, a really? wonderful team. They're great. Yeah, they're great. It's They're awesome. I actually worked on uh, the game like briefly uh, last year. I did some optimization stuff before they launched and and they're awesome. Huh. Do you like doing that kind of freelance development? Yeah, I actually, uh, it's been really nice uh, to just be like, yeah, I'll, I'll be here for uh, a short amount of time just to learn the, the culture and like learn how other people work. Uh, it's, it's, it's super nice to be able to be like, oh, yeah, I'm not having to work on my own game and uh, like focus in on like, oh, I have to worry about 
uh, this menu not working or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, um, do you have thoughts on video games and would you like to answer a bunch of great questions from the MinMax community? No, not really. All right, well, we'll see you next time, Charles. Thanks for All plugging right. Hyperdot, man. <laughs> yeah. we <appreciate> it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Chris Schultz writes in. He, sa- he asks, what is your favorite comfort food game? A game you can always go back to and have a good time with. For me, it's NHL 94 on Super Nintendo. The memories of me and dad playing when I was a kid makes me smile the second I hear the music. That's that's a specific one. I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah, comfort food gaming. I think people could use that a little bit right now. Uh, I guess for me, it would probably be Tetris. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. 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 I just can always play Tetris whenever yeah. whenever uh i prefer playing or my favorite version of tetris is the psp tetris the ea one that you can't get anymore uh it has a whole bunch of like variants in it as uh in addition to tetris oh that's weird but, um, i love seeing yeah. tetris is such a great example of just seeing how publishers interact with that li- license like it's so fun the idea that that license has been passed around so much at this point that we have ea's tetris ubisoft's tetris sega's tetris <laughs> yeah. like we see how everybody tackles it and a lot of them just clutter up the core idea which is why i love puyo puyo tetris where it's sega's just very pure mm-hmm. version of that if you just only play as the tetris variant but yeah that's oh, yeah. probably the correct answer and i'm glad leo isn't on this podcast right now and don't don't let him know that i said this but on his latest watch later uh video essay series it's all about peggle and he says in that video that peggle is on par with tetris in terms of game design which i love peggle Uh, don't get me wrong but tetris is uh at least three notches above peggle right or is anybody disagree with that no tetris is a classic it's timeless it works um not that peggle is like not the best well peggles no peggles not the best and it's not is. literally the best which is yeah. the tier that tetris is at yeah i agree um yeah other comfort food other than tetris for anybody <laughs> it is weird because I, I was yeah my answer was also going to be like tetris fact, <laughs> oh but, wow oh yeah. tetris yeah. effect yeah. that's yeah. very a lot interesting of that recently well uh, wait sorry go ahead no i, I think just, yeah I've, I've obviously dota is like a thing that i've i i don't know that i can recommend is like a th- you should learn dota to really get uh some comfort foods but at this point and now knowing as much as i know about that game it it does feel like comfort food of like okay i can actually be proficient at this and not feel like it's overwhelming my brain but at the same time it also is like i need something to distract me right now it's really good for that yeah yeah uh yeah anna what were you gonna say oh no just that um like any sort of puzzle game that allows me to go into smooth brain where i don't think and like go into like a, a kind of like a flow state, I feel like is a great comfort item beyond the general, you know, whatever nostalgia I have for what I played growing up, like Pokemon. Yeah, uh, you were talking about this with the backstage past folks watching live, but what's the go-to puzzle game at this point? So the go-to right now, the new go-to is uh, Luminous um, on the Switch, the remastered version. Oh, really? And it's, yeah. So that was just like, it's that in combination with like, I've been sprinkling that in between playing um, Yaku- the new Yakuza. And right. so it's been the an incredible combination of like, okay, I'm going to do like longer, more sort of immersive storytelling. And then I'm just going to like play something that's super hands-on. Yeah, that's smart. That's a good way to go. The uh, yeah, I guess uh, speaking of comfort food, Luminous would probably be up there as like, oh yeah, I'll just totally go back to that and just start playing uh, a couple of rounds. It's yeah. really good. This is such a stupid specific thing, but I can't wait to get my Series X and just lean into that backwards compatibility. You know, it has thousands of games across four generations, but specifically, I want to play the 360 version of Puzzle Fighter on Series X. Like, that is the game that I'm looking forward to mm-hmm. the most on my Series X <laughs> is to have that, like, upstairs on my TV and just get really into Puzzle Fighter, which I've only done for, like, you know, the main cabinet, but to actually have it at home and get into it, I think it's going to be super fun. Um, Real quick, though, uh, where would you rank Puzzle Fighter versus Peggle and Tetris? Great question. Mm-hmm. Great question, Thank Serial. Um, for my personal top 10 for this year, Puzzle Fighter is going to be damn high. Shockingly high. Really? Just heads up, everybody. I think I think it's obviously below Tetris. I'm not a fool, but it is above Peggle. And again, <laughs> I cannot say enough great things about Peggle. Peggle is for sure top 40 of all time for me. Uh, and Puzzle Fighter, I think, is above that. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it's funny. Dylan Drezik also wrote in asking about like the zone focused game. And for him, it's also Tetris that, yeah, it's interesting that the comfort food for a lot of people is also that like hyper focused game. Anything you can get that groove in on. That's a weird mm-hmm. way to phrase it. But um, even like it's certain genres, like, you know, a Stardew Valley or farming sim type thing, which, you know, Littlewood is a game that I need to go back to and play more of. Um, but it's a game that released this year. Um, it's it's kind of like an Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley, a lot more customization. Um, but it's awesome and it's under the radar. And hopefully when it releases on Switch, it'll find a, a new audience. But like right now, I think it's on sale for like 10 bucks on Steam. It's just a slam dunk. If you like those styles of games, uh, Littlewood on Steam is a great comfort food genre game, I'd say at this point. Um, Eric Seal submitted a comment on Patreon saying, Hey, Min Max, I just watched. Oh, no. I just wanted to give a shout out to Anna for your show Refreshed. The topics are diverse and fascinating. You bring on super knowledgeable guests and I look forward to each and every episode. It rules. That's really nice. Thank you. Uh, Any teases of what's coming up with Refreshed? Okay. So there's some stuff on the back burner. Um, We're... I, I'm like I'm genuinely really excited for some of the people coming on, and obviously I was excited for people coming on before, but I'm I don't know how to tease this without like revealing it. Um, let's just say if you're a fan of uh, fantasy baseball, we'll have an episode coming out that will be really fun, and, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> I don't I don't want to. All right, yeah. all right, look forward to it. Uh, Chris Logan has a comment saying, hey, Ben and the cohorts, my comment is in the interest of getting better. This is a very specific thing. It feels like something that we'd read off on Better Quest, but Chris put it here, so let's read it here. Uh, About three years ago, I made a simple change in my language I use that has greatly impacted my mental well-being. The core of the change is replacing I'm sorry with thank you. An example would be, instead of I'm sorry I'm late, try thank you for waiting for me. Well, there is, of course, appropriate times to say I'm sorry. Many of us use it as a crutch and feel too comfortable putting ourselves down to ease the situation. Instead, these can be opportunities to lift someone else up. Don't say, I'm sorry I'm so scatterbrained. Say, thank you for accepting me as I am. Chris, what a wonderful specific comment that I didn't expect. I, I'm going to try that because I do apologize a lot. Same. <laughs> uh, witty nickname here says, sorry if this is too dark. <laughs> Actually, witty nickname here, what you should be saying is thank you for appreciating how dark this is um yep. but last week i found myself wishing that city project red would have responded to the trolls lobbing death threats at them by publicly saying don't buy our game we don't want you what are they losing why don't they say that it's an interesting question yeah a lot of death threats going around the internet in general and specifically for the developers of city project red right now you know mm-hmm. i'm sure people will be angry at insomniac whenever miles morales releases for, for some detail in there but I think what they would have to lose by saying F off weirdos don't buy our game is just engaging in that conversation. I think that's the part that you don't factor in just Mm -hmm. stooping down to the level of even addressing that and arguing with them in any way or riling them up is just not worth it. Yeah. At some point, if, if someone is willing to issue you death threats, like they're not someone you can really argue with. Right. It's not a reason. You're not going to, you're not going to reply to them saying like, well, here's why you shouldn't try to kill me. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And like, and obviously, as a company, they don't, they're not really in a position to say, yeah, don't buy our game if you want to, like, they, they need to make money. So they're not going to do that. But I think there is maybe a, a, something about, like, hey, like, here's what we as a company stand for. Here's what we, you know, we're not going to, we don't condone death threats on our behalf. I think that's maybe a, a position where you take ownership a little bit more if anyone complains about, you know, here, like, this, I have this problem with this company and they're getting death threats. I think that's when you as a company say, like, hey, we disagree, but like, don't threaten to murder somebody, you know? Please don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is just Twitter in a nutshell, but that idea of you don't have to engage with everything. You don't have to lob out every opinion you have. Every time you're annoyed, there are plenty of responses to tweets where I get annoyed and it's just like that feeling like I'm going to correct it and just let it go. Just that little passive thing. Twitter could be so much healthier if people just let stuff go. Seeing adults get into arguments and be snippy with each other on Twitter is one of the saddest things I've ever witnessed. (laughs) It's constant people that I respect in the industry still just getting into it on Twitter. And it's like, what are you doing? Everybody, do you need this fix so badly? 
Yeah, there, there are moments where I think it is worth it, but like most of the time, uh, there are very few fights worth picking. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time, like a lot of the time, it is like incredibly petty about stuff that it's just like you're not you both of, like a none of neither of you are going to convince each other. Yeah, and B, this is just the pettiest argument you can have. Right, mm-hmm. like the you know example from it was a couple weeks ago last week or whenever that was like Alex Hutchinson uh, who we had on the podcast a bunch of times back at Game Informer uh, and he works at Stadia now but he was just tweeting that you know it's not fair that people can stream games for free as a whole kerfuffle blah 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 but then like you know Alex Navarro from Giant Bomb responded to him talking about like you know making mention of Stadia and then they got they were just snippy with each other talking about how Stadia isn't doing well then Alex Hutchinson was like oh Giant Bomb isn't doing well it's just that thing of like, come on, everybody, please. Just why take shots at Giant Bomb? Why even bother taking a shot at Stadia? It's, it's fine. It's just fine. Anyways, hey, on a lighter note, uh, Doreen Clyro wrote in and says, I've been reading Beloved by Toni Morrison and was wondering what literature has really inspired y'all in your life. What book has made a big impact on the way y'all see your, your life or the lives of others? Hmm. Very specific question. I like it. Um, it's tough. See. The lives of others things. Like, well, there's the favorite books that I had as a kid, but I'm trying to think about mm-hmm. like socially the books that had an impact. Yeah. There, uh, uh, on, on that front, there's a couple, I think the drunkards walk. Uh, I don't, I forget the name of the author, but it yeah. was like basically about probability and chance and how, how much of our lives are governed by, uh, by chance and stuff. And I think that kind of helped me set in like, an expectation of how career stuff would work, you know, in, mm-hmm. in terms of like people don't necessarily always like everyone who is in a position to get hired for a job is qualified. Right. And they just happen to pick someone out of a pool. Right. You know, mm-hmm. for whatever reasons. Um, so like getting a job does not mean that you're not good enough. It just means yeah. that like they just chose someone else and it could be for whatever number of reasons. And to not get so like visible, like super disappointed about that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah. then the other one I think, which was pretty recent was like the new Jim Crow, which is very uh, like on a very different level about like, Hey, this is why, you know, uh, African-Americans would be disinclined to trust police, you know, which is a very different thing, but it's, it helped pull a lot of stuff that I've kind of read on Twitter where it's like, ah, oh, I wish, I wish people would go more into depth into why they think this, mm. but uh, I'm not going to put it on them to make that effort. Right. So this was like a book that I read that kind of crystallized a lot of ideas of how the structures work. And that, that, that has kind of change my thinking about like you know why like when this person is making this statement it makes more sense in a weird way yeah sure well that's a, a different angle that i was going to take Sterl. i was just going to say that james and the giant peach is a very good <laughs> book and i read it a lot as a kid and it taught me that a team can come together to work together and you can get the silkworm out and they can help you rope in those seagulls and then the peach can fly you know yeah uh, yeah i was gonna say similarly um a book that really impacted me i read in college and it was called uh, it's just called The Conquest of the Americas, and it's by this like, Bulgarian uh, like historian named Tessin Todorov. And it's kind of like an alternate view of looking at like the conquest of the Americas. Just And it's just really kind of, um, you know, you're raised like learning all these things about history and American history and like how the U.S. was founded, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so then to go to college and that be the first book that I read, like completely uh, shifted my worldview and like changed how you know like how I how I go through the world I guess where'd you where'd you go to college I went to McAllister in St. Paul oh look at that yeah I, it, I know this is one of those things of you know with COVID we don't hang out that much but every once in a while I have those moments of like I lose track of Anna's history because it's like Chicago for a chunk Florida for a chunk yeah. but starting near yeah. St. Cloud Minnesota yeah. No. And I have a really weird life history. Like I lived overseas for like, I grew up overseas for a period of time. So my games history is really weird because there's an entire chunk of my life where I was like not getting games on the regular schedule. And so like part of the reason that Earthbound was such an informative game for me was that community was like very online and like, you know, made mother three is like a ROM and yeah. I could get access to that um, when I was overseas. Okay. So. Hang on. Yeah. Just lay it all out real quick. Your, your okay. path across the globe and really? years of your okay. life uh <laughs> it's it's actually really long um but the really really quick abridged is um indiana ohio florida minnesota uh then i was overseas in italy for a while 
uh, back to Ohio, Illinois, <laughs> Minnesota. What? Are you yeah. running from the law? What is happening? <laughs> uh, my parents, well, they worked for the State Department and they were professors and there are not many jobs <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> you kind of go where uh, you can get work so. it, wait how long were you in italy four years what yeah do you speak italian yeah that's amazing how does that not come up yet you think you'd be dropping that all the time uh it's been a while it's been like six or seven years since i've lived there and so it's it's more like a memory <laughs> Oh, perfect. Well, hey, here's the perfect question for you then. Um, Hunter S. Sachs writes in and says, simple question, what's your favorite Mario noise? <laughs> so uh, long, gay Bowser. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest Italian phrase in history. <laughs> he says, I'm partial to the, oh yeah, when you return to the observatory <laughs> in Mario Galaxy. That's um, good. How long did you practice that Mario impression, Ben? Like, as a games professional, you know? Yeah, and I like to space. label myself as a games professional. Yeah, there's a lot of time looking in the mirror. trying. You know, it's basically Raging Bull, but I'm trying to psych myself up. Just going, oh, yeah. It's a lot oh, of you, good Mario. Go. <laughs> uh, that's tough. Yeah, Mario Noise. Does that include sound effects? Because I think, objectively, you'd have to go with beating a level in Super Mario World as the best. Sure, yeah. It's so good. I yeah. like I like the more ominous sound of uh, finding the secret exit in Super Mario World. Okay. Right, that really loud, almost like THX spacey, like... Right, <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, I think it would be like a... It's like a toss-up between like the Bowser... Thing, <laughs> or yeah, um, uh, it would be like the... Yeah! <laughs> kind of one. Y'all are so, so good at your little uh, Mario impressions. Well, here. You, are, you, just, you haven't tried I hard enough, Anna. You can do it if you tried. I, You like, know, I will say I'm never more scared than when we're on a stream and you tell me to do a voice. <laughs> Which is every it's stream. Me, it's really, you have to lean into the... So, for example, if you're going to say, like, Mario's famous quote, it is, it is I, Mario. Right. If right. You had to, yeah, if you had to say that. Yeah. No, we I, I, I also like the sound of him getting uh, lighting his butt on fire. When I was going to say, yeah, which I, oh, let's yeah. See, I think it go a little something like this. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> That's bad. That sounded like a witch at Halloween. Charles, can you yeah. do a better one? <laughs> oh, I, I it's like, yo, to... whoa, 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 whoa. But it's a more extreme version. That sounded no, like I, Toad. I, I, well, the way I would try it, let me see. I'm going to try to step back here. Yeah. Oh, oh. Ha <laughs> ha. Is that was that when he when he hits the when he hits his butt on fire? Is that uh, it's well, hard to do. Laughing is hard. It's Laughing. really surprisingly oh, yeah. hard. Let's like, see if we can pull it yeah. up uh, and try and do one for one. Let's see oh, yeah. Mario sixty four butt fire. How do you? <laughs> okay. Mario's also, another shout out would be Luigi uh, calling out for Mario in Luigi's Mansion. Would be the mm. oh, it's just mm. the yeah, best. Mario. Luigi's Mansion is great. Sounds. So good. Okay, here's all Super Mario 64 sound effects. Oh god. This is unnerving. <laughs> this is your brain on drugs. No. <laughs> Hold on. I'm, I'm so sending fast. you I'm sending you a uh, thing on the flag. You found it? Oh, I did it. I I found what I think Probably the best we're gonna do on short notice. Oh, oh. oh. Ninety ninety. Ah, spaghetti. <laughs> Again, ah, the, that was me as a kid. Ah, mamma mia. Oh, it's coming up next. <laughs> game. Okay, that is game. so hard. And then he says um, game at the end of that. Okay, so yes. <laughs> so it's like. Yeah, that's. Uh, it sounds too cackly. Yeah. It has so a hard. very specific yeah. rhythm to it. Yeah. But it's not wah, which you're used to doing like wah, wah, ha, ha. It's, it's, oh, it's so hard. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> game. That's why they need that Martin A touch. <laughs> yep. To yeah. have him jump in there and say but game. That's why they pay him the big bucks. Yeah. That's probably why they pi probably play. P Never mind. I can't yeah. talk anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's see. Ian T. Clark writes in and says, I downloaded and played the Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity demo last week. I must say that I was very impressed and my expectations were more than exceeded. I have seen and heard a lot of outlets complaining about frame rate issues. I never noticed that stuff. 
Is it because I've been playing games since 1985 and my brain filters out performance drops because it just expects them to happen? What is wrong with me? Am I dying? Well, we're all well, dying a little bit slowly in D. Clark, but um, yeah, the frame rate thing, I definitely noticed it playing handheld in Age of Calamity, but Charles, I'm curious as a developer, how attuned mm-hmm. are you to noticing frame rate drops? Uh, I am only attuned to it because I care a lot about like production yeah not necessarily game development not the game development side of my brain is kicking in it's more about production like i mean like for example uh (laughs) like i care about like you know i have all these lights in the background i was like oh hey look i have lighting on me and stuff like i i just care about like production kind of things um so i noticed those like small hitches and and whatnot um but it hasn't like been a deal breaker uh for me uh but i also know that like you're not dying because you don't notice it. Like my brother uh, can't tell the difference between 30 and 60 frames uh, per second without it being side by side. And mm. even then, sometimes he doesn't notice the difference between the things. That's interesting. Um, even on so, the yeah. video side of things, I feel bad that I'm not better at noticing that. I should. I feel <laughs> like as a video producer, first and foremost, I should care more and notice frame rates more. But it's, it takes a lot, you know, even like Last of Us Part 2, which we talking on the deepest side, like, okay, there's a section with like fire where I noticed it dipping a little bit on my original PlayStation 4. But even that type of thing doesn't bother me too much. Unless we're talking like explosions going off in GoldenEye or Perfect Dark where it gets down <laughs> to like two frames per second. Obviously, yeah. that's a nightmare, but it, it doesn't really bug me too much. I wouldn't say like I've never been the kind of person like when I review games to kind of like, oh, yeah, the frame rate is really bad. But I do notice that stuff because I when I bought my first gaming PC in like 2010, um, I remember th- thinking like, oh, did I get my money's worth out of this? So I did a bunch of benchmarks and stuff. And so that basically broke my brain. And like I can <laughs> I can note I, like, I can't tell the difference between like 50 and 60 if you make them consistent. But I can notice if 60 drops into 50, like I can notice those frame rate drops a, a little bit more. And it gets harder the higher you go. Like I can't tell the difference mm-hmm. between like 90 and maybe like 120, I think would be pretty hard. Yeah, uh, not doing it side by side. But uh, I think it's more about consistency for me. Like I don't, I'm not the kind of person who thinks that every game should run at uh, 60 frames a second, especially like something like The Last of Us Part Two. I don't think needs to be at 60 frames um, for it to like be better. I don't think that intrinsically makes it a better game. But mm-hmm. if you're going for that type, like Devil May Cry, I think would be very different experience if you were at 30 versus 60. I exactly. think I um, seeing the Miles Morales trailer made me think about how developers could actually play with frame rates to you know stylize games and we haven't really seen that and so i'm wondering now like oh it'd be so cool to be able to see developers like intentionally you know with different parts of the game incorporate like different frame rates oh yeah oh that'd be such a oh oh and now i'm just thinking about how insane that is it basically do the opposite of what they did with the miles morales suit in spider-man where it's a game that's technically running at 120 Mm -hmm. but everything in the game is running at 30 Mm -hmm. except for one character walks on screen at 120 yeah oh that'd be so gross i can't tell if you're getting excited or you're cringing i don't know i want to see it i just it (laughs) yes right i I could see if you're making like a claymation game like it's similar Mm -hmm. to that one thing that happens in uh uh, towards the end of undertale uh where it just feels like oh they're very incorporating a very different look here yeah um (laughs) to to have like a game that looks like claymation for example or like stop motion animation and then all of a sudden have it be like you know here's a character from like out of time or something and this person happens to be animating incredibly smoothly it would also yeah almost be this weird like um, like that episode of uh, Treehouse of Horror when yes. Homer steps into that. What, like it would be kind of this weird surreal. Like, oh, this is kind of creepy in a way. It feels like the mm-hmm. game is looking directly at me. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can only name. Well, I can name like two games that have like messed around with. Oh, this is a game's graphics thing, which would be like uh, uh, what you called uh, Evo Land uh, does this, where you know they go from like evolve from pixels to whatnot, and I think that. Uh, the frame rate wasn't capped, but like everything was like super not smooth animations and then it grows to smoother animations and stuff. Right. Uh, and I think that the order 1886 uh, capped it at 24 frames a second for cinematic. Ooh, that's a yeah, good I question. Remember. I don't think so. They were very big okay. on what they called filmic presentation with Ready at Dawn, but I don't mm-hmm. think so. Cause I remember even 
for South Park because South Park's animated at 24. And so for oh, yeah. the game, um, Obsidian was like, yeah, we tried running it at 24 and it just did not work as a video game. So don't run your video sure. games at 24. So based on that, no. I would imagine that maybe Red Aton sure. didn't do that for the order. I think no. the order was also like ultra widescreen, right? That was like the thing where yes. they had a very different aspect ratio. Although, right. yeah, I think any game that tries to do something weird with with frame rate would meet like people thinking like, oh, this machine is busted. Because I paid like however much because there's always this like contingent of people who who think that if they're not getting 60 frames or not getting their money's worth. Mm-hmm. So I think it would run into that of like, oh, like, yeah, you're trying to make this artistic decision, but I want my frames, you know, because I've spent I money on this I paid for these computer. frames. Exactly. That's exact. <laughs> I feel like that's exactly how those people think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, filled with photos what's that I, I, sorry that was a pun because you said that you need your frames and so then uh, i added on I that my house is filled with photos oh and so i i need them. that was that was good excellent excellent oh no ladies and really, gentlemen yeah. excellent I'm yeah, really hitting my home. stride <laughs> <laughs> Christian Jimenez writes in and says, Hi, Cohortians. That's a first. Thank you. Um, why do Sony and Microsoft run next-gen commercials when demand outweighs supply? Isn't that just a waste of money? Yeah. Hype. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hype. They just want to create that want yep. and have yeah. every person begging a, a wealthier person in their life to buy them a console, I think is the way it works. Yeah. I think it's yeah. also about, you know, advertising is less about getting you to buy the product and more like planting the product in your mind. So yeah. it, it, they were obviously playing a long game where it's like, yeah, you don't, you're not going to get one this holiday season, but you're like thinking about it, you know, like, well, I can't get one. But in the back of my mind somewhere, I'm keeping the idea that if, oh, I see, if I see a PS5, I'm getting one. Like, and oh, yeah. you know, you might be, you know, shopping in January and if you see one, oh, there's a PS5. Mm-hmm. And then that's when you get it. And that's how that ad worked. Right. I, uh, I was thinking about making a video about this, a standalone video. So I was going through and looking at all the commercials they're releasing for the PlayStation 5 and Series X at this point. They are so weird. They're both in the same vein of like abstract, inspirational. Like the Series X launch trailer is just like a guy floating through space looking at worlds colliding. It's kind of like game ambiguous. There's like a little bit of Master Chief somewhere, but it's not like a Halo ad. It's just kind of a nod to something. And then the Sony one is just like stock footage of a rocket ship taking off as Travis Scott narrates it. It's like they're both detached from games in such a big way and maybe that's just a sign of where these consoles are at when they have to be like oh just buy it because there's a symphony orchestra and it's showing man walking on the <laughs> yeah. moon it's like a place i will five. say I <laughs> like i was i saw commercials for the first time in a long time yesterday while watching the news and i was watching the commercials i was like wow this is such a novel experience like watching <laughs> commercials like taking a commercial break <laughs> And the commercials are like so weird and so cheesy and kind of like tacky. And it's like they haven't been updated because they just like stopped with Netflix, you know? And so I wonder if it's just an issue with commercials in general that they're just kind of like slightly off. No one tries anymore because nobody's watching commercials anymore. Is that the idea? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Huh. I also I think those ads are very like um, what are the 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 five gum ads where they're just oh, yeah. like, this is completely abstracted from what it's like to actually chew gum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So those are always like weird and I think we'll we'll look back on those ads as like this was like a weird corny thing, right? Yeah. Uh, this was of the time. So I kind of right. prefer those to like actual good ads because I remember the 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 weird ads more fondly. Yep. Right. The baby PS3 commercial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. or the weird GameCube stuff where it's just that cube of glass in the room and it's like they're kind of looking at super mario sunshine in the cube it's so mm-hmm. bizarre yeah. obviously the playstation 9 commercial it's a classic for the ps2 yeah. uh anna do you remember that were you too young for that one the playstation what Nine? <laughs> <laughs> so they had a playstation 2 ad like before the ps2 came out and it was a commercial for the playstation 9 and it was just like this glowing sphere and i think there was like a racing game and it was like oh check out the playstation 9 it was like this weird sci-fi commercial and then at the end it said i think the conclusion was like that's the future the present is the playstation 2 yeah. it's like this weird pivot and it's like i, I don't know i what grew the up in the is. wrong time period i did not see that but i'm going to go look it up <laughs> okay you gotta this. check out that playstation 9 it's sweet uh, the champ writes in and asks, how do you feel about dailies in a lot of these current video games? I feel like they're getting pretty annoying. I don't play Genshin Impact having, I don't even play Genshin Impact, haven't played since the first week, yet I often log in just to get my daily rewards. I got bad news, champ. That's plan. 
you're getting played by Genshin Impact every day. Mm, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about it, everybody? Yeah, I think that it can... I, I've definitely been in that cycle of like, I'm just doing this because the progr- like I'm kind of more enticed by the progression mechanics than I am the actual game. And I think one way that I've kind of gotten better about that is just like, am I actually enjoying what I'm doing? Yeah. So I think that there are very few games where I'll do those kinds of dailies now anymore, but I like them as an excuse to play a game you already like and feel like, oh, you know, here's an extra incentive to play versus like, you know, what I was um, doing with like WoW and stuff where it's like, I'm just only going to level until uh, I get to the, the part where, because I think you can sleep and then you come in and then you have like the refreshed experience. So you have like double XP until you get a certain point in your bar. And there were like, there was a period where I would only play until I got to that bar and then I'd be done. And mm-hmm. then I realized I didn't like playing WoW. Uh, and that was the only reason I was playing. So oh. I had to stop. So I basically said, like, that's when I kind of stopped playing. But uh, yeah. for like Dota even has like a daily win bonus now. Um, so I played, I use that as an incentive to play Dota because I like Dota. But mm-hmm. uh, I've definitely slowed down about, I don't want to play this game just to, for the login bonuses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm really trying to think about the game that I was most hooked on the daily aspect it's not my cup of tea. Not the way I like playing games. I think it might have been Animal Crossing earlier this year. Yeah. Like yeah, having yeah. the that bonus bell thing rolling. It's yeah. probably the well, biggest Well, it sort of twists your arm, it feels like, sometimes where it's like, oh, it wants, it clearly wants me to do this game or do this part of the game so much. Like with Animal Crossing, I tried to let go of this pressure to do dailies. Yeah, because it's Nick Miles couldn't. on that one. Yeah. And then I just mm-hmm. dropped the whole game, unfortunately, even though I did enjoy the other parts. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think. Uh yeah, recently me and my brother have been playing uh well, we started playing Valorant, uh which is surprising because wow. my brother does not like playing uh shooters. Yeah. Let alone uh like games like Counter-Strike. Uh and then we uh tried out Rogue Company because it's a third-person shooter. Uh and that has dailies. And we were uh and like I enjoy it uh, like enough, uh, and my brother enjoys it more than Valorant because it's a third-person shooter. Um, but like, yeah, that is part of the reason. Like, I, hey, you want to jump on so we can do the dailies or something like that? And then we just stop immediately after. <laughs> it's so um, gross. And it's yeah, it's like I did enjoy myself playing the game, but it is the incentive to play it that's weird. But like a, a game that has dailies that I don't. Uh, like but i really enjoy is uh ghost of tsushima's legends uh, mode which oh yeah i can i can gush about please yeah that. we haven't talked about it yet on the podcast please oh yeah that mode is amazing it is uh, like i have no idea how that that's free and <laughs> that it is already a, like a hugely exceptional single player game uh and then on top of that they made a like this polished of experience with the, the multiplayer is just like I just can't and it's it's amazing it's just it oozes all this like personality and charm and wow it's just really really good do they uh, have the raid in there yet yes the raid came out on uh hollow eve yeah so it was, it was on the 30th of October, okay and I have not played it but I am raid ready and I'm uh, I've actually been playing with people in the community uh we've been playing or we've been jumping on and playing some uh ghost legends and things is it insane to think of going back to before ghost came out and just be like within a couple months people will be talking about this game saying that they're raid ready (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) i know like that was not a thing that i would have thought of uh doing and the the announcement came out of nowhere because Mm -hmm. i was like man this was a great game like this was a phenomenal game already and then they were like yeah we're gonna add multiplayer and it's gonna have all of this stuff that are uh, that you would normally like associate with like a a games as a surface kind of thing, like a Destiny or a or a Avengers kind of thing, and like they do it so well. Um, but yeah, I, again, I can gush about that. <laughs> can you play that? Gush received. Whether or not like is that independent of the single player? Yes, it is independent of the single player, and it also has matchmaking, uh, and it okay. works really well. So like you wow. can just uh, play with randos, and uh, I, like every time that I have played with random people, uh, I've been like it's been like a really cordial like experience because the emotes that you do is like you bow and then you like uh you can do like oh over here or like ping things and stuff like that and it's really like everything you do with uh the other person seems like oh yeah we are totally working together we're we're trying to work together and not be like oh i'm a troll uh and stuff like that so it's been 
so much fun uh, playing with them. Um, there is something that. about that co-op angle for like the tone of the community I think is fascinating. Like I remember working with Capcom on the Monster Hunter World and Iceborne cover stories back at Game Informer. Like the Monster Hunter community is awesome and really supportive and positive. And even talking to the folks at Capcom at that time, they're like, yeah, it's just awesome that this community has bubbled up and they're positive and supportive. Whereas the Street Fighter community, you know, they they let their opinions be known. It's just like a game that's all about fighting one-on-one builds up animosity compared to a co-op game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And um, I guess to get back to the uh, original point of dailies <laughs> before I got oh, on this yeah, tangent. Yeah, yeah uh, I don't, or like I am not encouraged to do the dailies in that, even though it does have dailies in it. Yeah. Uh, largely because the dailies are like, they take forever for you to have to do um so it is something that i'll in the back of my head i'll be like oh yeah i should probably do this thing that i normally don't do in order to get these dailies done but like that is not at all an incentive for me to play it um so yeah it's been it's been an interesting experience in that regard uh, yeah specifically I that is interesting. I promise I was paying attention, but I also had an epiphany while you're talking that <laughs> if we ever did a daily news show at Minmax in the future, hypothetically in the future, this is not something we're planning. Please don't take this. Uh, please take this with a grain of salt. Um, it should be called the Dailies Show. Isn't that a good mm-hmm. name for like a video game daily news show? There you go. Okay, written down. Um, okay, back on track. Far as writes in and says, "Hey, Serial." What did you think of Avatar The Last Airbender? I don't know why they asked you this. Is there a reason they asked you this? <laughs> I, I, I think last year, late last year, um, I watched all of it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I spent $20 because I think people were like, I don't think this will ever end up on Netflix. And then it ended up on Netflix <laughs> uh, a few months later. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. I think that that game, I was going to say game, um, that show I think starts off a, a little like in its play field where it's like oh this is like a children's uh kind of like american made anime like oh, i like this but like towards the end i think it gets really really good and i think a lot of the stuff they do with like uh writing and 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 like telling a long form story with an animated show i think does a lot of work like it's it's really fantastic great uh, and then i watched cora which i also enjoyed but it's kind of more up and down in terms of seasons okay right on but yeah. i mean is it a must see i've seen the first four episodes and i liked it but am yeah, I, that, I, I would definitely say um, keep keep watch, like if you're interested, keep watching because I think it is worth like a lot of the stuff they set up definitely pays off towards the end. OK, um, especially I think Toph is like my favorite character in that series by far. And you don't really meet her until a little bit later on. Oh, interesting. Um, and she's just like a fantastic character. I love her. Um, but yeah, the, it's really good about having like this very um, kind of self-contained, but also expansive narrative where you feel a lot for the characters by the end. and It doesn't feel like tried at all. Yeah. So. Uh, just, you know, the chat with the backstage pass here watching us live are going nuts saying, yes, Serial, yes, yeah. preach Serial. Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of fans of Avatar yeah. out there, I get it. Yeah, And then, I, yeah, what, uh, the first season of Core I think is amazing. I think it's maybe the, the best work that that team has done. But then the other seasons kind of go up and down a little bit. But gotcha. Um, also very good. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Last Airbender uh, in Legends or Ghost of Tsushima Legends, <laughs> the we narrator go. is uh, uh, Uncle Iroh. Oh, really? And, yeah. Really? And I'm yeah. like, oh, man, this is... And the... Oh, I'm about to go off again. But the narration is amazing as well. Okay. I'm <laughs> Avatar <laughs> level narration. Yeah. It's uh, so good. Mick Manga writes in, it's not really a question, but it's an interesting oddity. Yeah, we love this. If you have an interesting oddity about the game industry, that's what we're all about. So please send it in. This is maybe too nerdy and specific, but I find it interesting. So anyways, Mick Manga says, Earth Defense Force 5 originally was rated M two years ago. It was a digital-only release, which meant a quicker review process. Anyway, last week, P-Cube released Earth Defense Force 5 as a physical release, and uh, this time it's now rated T, but nothing has changed. It's bizarre, but this is the first time I've seen a game's rating lowered. I thought you might get a kick out of this. Hmm. It is odd. Thank you, Mick Manga. I wonder why they did that. Uh, Kate Mead writes in. Oh. oh, yes, Charles. Oh, yeah. Uh, I guess from a developer standpoint, I think it would probably be because they went through a different process. So, like, they probably went through the iARC process, which is like the it's an easy way to get all your stuff digitally uh, rated and whatnot. But if you go through like a physical release, then you have to go through ESRB proper. Um, and they probably were like, oh, this we'll, is a we'll do a more like 
refined version of our uh, suggestions and stuff. See, Charles, thank you for being on this podcast. We were just ready to gloss over and be like, I don't know, developer nonsense, Ooh, whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, wasn't it? Wasn't there a thing with like Oblivion and where I think it used to be T and then it rated it was rated M or they switched it? I don't know. Yeah, I remember hearing something about that, but oh. I don't remember which way it switched either. Gotcha. Uh, did you guys see the Starfield headlines on Tuesday? Yeah. Or maybe it was Monday where Todd Howard gave some interview talking about Starfield and... It annoyed me just seeing it because he's like, oh, we are really reworking this Bethesda engine. This is the biggest update we've done since Morrow into Oblivion. I I just remember specifically like being on the Skyrim cover story for Game Informer and all this talk about it's a basically whole new engine. It's completely different. It's like, yeah, I know they've been working on it and it's not that big of a team, but I'm just embracing for Starfield to still feel so much like a Bethesda game in some of the less than great areas but also the positive areas too anyways uh Cade mead writes in and says hello surreal specifically Hel- hello Cade mead yeah, acknowledges your request a lot today mm-hmm. yeah. uh you might have heard that gg accent core has added ggpo rollback net code to its beta version all right look alive everybody uh you might also have heard that the concurrent players on steam briefly surpassed the fgc current mainstays is it safe to get my hopes up for a fighting game renaissance now, or will devs continue to ignore the benefits of good netcode? Uh, so I did, I did hear about it. It was also on sale for like 80% off. So I think mm. a lot that, that both of those things, I think contributed a lot to that. But, uh, I think with, you know, uh, the way things have turned out in the last year, I think it's put a lot, a huge spotlight on rollback network code. Mm-hmm. And I think developers are seeing that like, Oh, if we have to run our events online, we, basically have to pretend that the netcode is good uh, and a lot of people are gravitating towards games depending on the netcode and not whatever the quality of the game is so like mm-hmm. king of fighters 2002 also got rolled back netcode and that experienced a similar like spike um so i think the hope is that not that we'll see like a resurgence of fighting games again but that the fighting games we get down the line like strive i think is i'm guessing one of the reasons it got delayed was to implement better rollback netcode mm. Um, so I think developers even now, I think are probably going to put a lot more effort than they have been to making sure the online play is actually good. Mm-hmm. There we go. Awesome. Uh, Zeon Gonzalez writes in and says, hello cohorts. When I was younger till about high school, I was not able to play video games at all until the weekend. Just a cruel rule placed on me by my parents. And I was wondering if your all's parents did anything similar. Yeah. It yes. was like only video games on the weekends. And also, like, a time limit per child. <laughs> per child. So that were they pretty yeah. strict about, like, all right, do you remember what it was? Um, it was, like, I think we slowly <laughs> worked it up. Um, I think it's it only started at, like, an hour each, though. But Oof. there's three of us. So it was, like, okay, one hour, one person playing next, blah, blah, blah. So we actually did get through, like, the games. We'd all play the same, same f- file. And then, nice. you know, like... I would take the first leg of Zelda and then my brother would take the second. And then we all watch for all three hours. So, oh, yeah. Okay. That's a way to nice. cheat yeah. the system. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Charles? Oh, yeah. Um, I went through the whole ESRB rating system. Oof. Uh, yeah. I. The problem is that we weren't on it before and then I, I said something and then we were on it. Wait, uh, <laughs> now you're, you're a very kind man who does not like yeah. to swear now. Oh, yes, I know. Do you remember what yes. you said? Or are you willing to say it on this podcast? Oh, yeah. No, it was... A, it, I had a nightmare. Um, my dad was... Uh, okay, so my dad was playing Torok, and I was watching my dad play Torok. <laughs> uh-huh. I was like, oh, man, Torok's awesome. And then I had a nightmare that was a sort of a nightmare, but it wasn't actually a nightmare. Like, I wasn't like, whoa, I'm so frightened or whatever. Uh, but then I... I was like, oh, yeah. Or I was like talking to my brother or something. And I was like, oh, yeah, I had this weird dream last night about Torok and like these dinosaurs were chasing this uh, person and like was eating them or whatever. I don't know. It was like some type of nightmare around yeah. there. Uh, and then my dad overheard that and was like, <laughs> oh, wait, oh, no. And then uh, be, and then because of that, uh, he was more strict on the things that we consumed and watched in terms of uh, video game stuff. Uh, he was already strict on uh, the rating systems for like movies and whatnot. Right, but, right. Um, but he but just yeah, thought, oh, so Turok's just like silly cartoon dinosaur fun, but he wasn't realizing that he was traumatizing his children with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. But uh, it was it was just like 
he he knew that this was more mature, but he was like, oh, I'm in the room. I'm here. Clearly, uh, I'm I'm playing down or not playing down the violence, but I'm trying to put the violence in context and whatnot. Uh, but because I said something, oh, you fool. Yeah, then yeah, and that also happened before uh, with uh, Splinter Cell. It was Double Agent, uh, the multiplayer. He was he was playing multiplayer with his friend, and he was like, "Hey, Charles, he, play the control." Or, here, uh, I need to eat or whatever, and didn't realize that the game was rated M. And then me and my brother were playing that game for like three days, and then I opened my mouth again, as or and because my cousin was like, "Oh, I want to play that game," I was like, "No, you can't, cause it's M." And then. <laughs> And then he heard that oh, uh, we couldn't boy. play it. Yeah, my parents were, I don't know. I don't remember them putting any restrictions on me. But also we didn't have, like I only had an Apple II in Game Gear until oh. the PlayStation came out, you know. So it wasn't, I wasn't really consumed as a kid. But my nephew, one of them in particular, loves video games so much. But his parents will not let any be in the house because of that. And I'm really struggling with it because it's like he will get fully obsessed and it is scary how he can only lock in on video games. Like it is like an otherworldly possession. So it's like, I understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, like every time I play video games with him, he's six, but he's so bad. He does not understand how to control any video game ever. Like it's just a challenge every time. And compared to like, you know, playing games with like Kyle's daughter when she was growing up, like she's a pro, she's got it all down. And so I start to get paranoid about like this kid is losing out on the social aspect of video games. And he's going to be so terrible at all video games now throughout school. And it's going to be a really important part of his childhood is talking and connecting with friends about games. So what do you do? Uh, in that situation, do you let your kid play all the games they want so they can stay up to date on the coolest, hippest medium around to talk to their friends about? I don't know. I mean, I think I personally, I don't, I don't know. Like, I would never tell anyone else what to do. If it were my kid, I just would allow them to play and you play with them and you make it into a socially shared thing, you know? Yeah. And my hope would be that, like, your, um, your sibling would see like, Oh, my, my son connects a lot playing uh, these games with my brother. It's a really great thing, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe like ease up, just a bit, you know, um, like maybe some educational games, maybe some games with like, you know, that feel a little safer. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, that, that's, that's a smart way to do it. Like we, you can only play the games if we're playing it together and we have to talk through it. You know, like you can yeah. play Pokemon, but mm-hmm. I want you to read what's on the screen when you can, mm-hmm. that type of thing. Like, yeah, that's probably mm-hmm. a smart way to go. Yeah. I guess as a kid who grew up not being able to play things like, uh, or I mean, I didn't play Halo until later because of the age restriction and stuff. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, uh, where it's like, oh, I can't really talk to you about uh, Grand Theft Auto because I haven't played it because I yeah. can't play it. Uh, yeah. and stuff like that i just yeah. I, I, oh it just it freaks me out to think of this kid getting in to you know a school classroom scenario and every kid talking about Fortnite. he's just like i have no idea what this is like yeah. although he mm-hmm. has like he's knows yeah. of roblox and stuff which is fascinating yeah. to see what he knows anyways yeah. uh fabled ursa submits a comment on patreon saying hello friends last week's game demo conversation got me wondering is there a game demo that won you over and got you to buy a game? I played the demo for Time Splitters 2 back in the day, not knowing anything about the series, and it totally blew me away. IGN.com. Uh, I definitely miss the demo disc days, but at least some companies are still putting a little teaser of their wares out there for the world to try. I remember that Time Splitters 2 demo because I love Time Splitters 1, and that Time Splitters 2 demo was awesome, where it's in the snow and it was just a huge leap up. But most impactful demos are demos that converted y'all. What do you think of? Hmm. Uh, I th- I think on Xbox because there were so many more demos back then. I think Prey and Bioshock I think are the two that I think about when I think about demos. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I I hadn't heard anything about either of them. Um, and so when I played the demos, I was like, man, this is really weird and, and like kind of unexpected. I, I'm really into this. Uh, and like I remember Prey's demo was especially long. I think it was like two hours long or something. Huh. Wow. Uh, so I, I really got in. I, I beat that demo multiple times before I got the game. Nice. Yeah. Mm. I, th- I just think of that era. I always just think back to like the PS1 early PS2 era for demos, which by the way, during Extra Life for the big stream, I'm going to be streaming some of my old PS1 demo discs. So that'll be kind of the, the replay segment there. But cool. Yeah. I think of, um, I think of Eco. 
uh, for, well, also actually frequency I found from a demo disc too. So it was a lot of that early PS2 stuff, but I remember Eco playing that demo before the game came out and being like, what is this? And someday we'll ask, you know, best friend Ronnie about that experience. Cause I remember just like raving and ranting to him about like, look at the animation of this game. They're holding hands and there's like vibration, in the controller from the hands when they talk about, it. I just couldn't imagine something as impressive as eco. And so that was a huge one out of the blue and it's such a weird game to demo. You think it wouldn't demo well, but back then just technically, I thought it was mind blowing. I think a lot of, uh, like you mentioned, the PS one demos, uh, were ones that, if I had disposable income at the time, <laughs> I would probably have been converted. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of the Xbox Live Arcade demos, uh, like I probably wouldn't have uh, played, like begged my dad to, hey, can you get Cloning Clyde? Because uh, uh, like the, I wouldn't have had interest in from the screenshots or something. Wait, what is the name um, of the game? Uh, cloning Clyde. What is Cloning it was like Clyde? A really, yeah, a really early Xbox Live Arcade yeah. game. Huh. I think it was like 05. I think it came out a few weeks after the console, if I remember correctly. Yeah, oh, wow. and that was the first uh, game that I got all of the achievements in. And I was like, oh man, that's uh, there you go, a, t- a passage in time. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I guess a more relevant, semi-relevant uh, demo would be Black Sight Area 51. Uh, there was a demo of that that I played, and I was like, "Oh man, this is kind of fun." And then I, uh, then I ended up buying it. I was like, "Oh man, that was kind of mediocre." <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so it was that. But yeah, yeah, demos uh, nowadays aren't. Uh, they're not as many, but yeah, there's there's a couple out there. Yeah, who needs demos when you have so many free games? <laughs> that was just the mm-hmm. point. So we liked it because they were free games. Yeah. Uh, hey, what do y'all like for uh, question of the week? Also, people at the backstage pass, you can chime in too. Do you have a favorite? Ooh, man, there was a lot of good ones. I mean, I do like the Mario noise. That's mm. where I went, immediately went to. Okay, yeah. that's a good sign if it's your number one go-to. Uh, I like the frame rate issue is more interesting than I thought. Um, the comfort food one was also... It is nice. It's nice. Yeah. I like that one about the, uh, the, the rating stuff, like the parents... Yeah, oh, yeah, I like it too. Uh, chat in the backstage pass, they're leaning Mario noise. And that was the first mm-hmm. instinct. Should we give it to Mario noise? Sure. I All right. Sure. Great. Congratulations to Hunter S. Sachs. You win this awesome vinyl from I Am 8-Bit. You can check out everything else on I Am 8-Bit store. Thank you so much, everybody, for submitting great questions and comments on Patreon.com. Now it's time for something called Get a Load of This. Oh, boy. Who wants to step up? Who is ready to just knock one I'll, out of the park? Uh, sure, I'll do yeah, one. Yeah, take it away, Serial. Yes. Here's uh, a headline from thegamer.com. Uh, <laughs> uh, GameStop is having a TikTok competition for its employees, and one of the prizes is 10 extra labor hours. Serial, no, um, I kid you not, I was eyeing that as an <laughs> original. Uh, uh, that's insane. Yeah, so uh, the the quick version is that basically they're having this contest where they they made up a dance. I don't know if you guys have seen the the dance itself. Unbelievable. But it, it's basically this co- like a combination of like a couple dances, but it's very much like a Macarena esque thing. <laughs> they call it the Macarena two point oh. Yeah. Are they really? No. <laughs> oh, I, oh no. Because uh, I just watched I watched the TikTok in, uh, on silent, uh, but it's like this weird <laughs> lame dance, and they're having like people try to do like be, people from the stores, like the store employees yeah. are. They're like, yeah, give us your best TikTok, and the winner gets like an Echo Dot, uh, like so a bunch of, like am, some Amazon products, a hundred dollar uh, Visa gift card, and ten extra labor hours to use during Black Friday, uh, and which was a kind of vague wording, but I think most people have interpreted it as. Uh, your store gets 10 additional hours to basically throw someone else in there during the Black Friday weekend. <laughs> it's so oh, insane. Which is hey. it's dystopic. It is <laughs> absurd. Yeah. Yeah. A company would have to encourage its employees to not get overwhelmed uh, at their own store. Like, you should just be giving those hours to people if the stores need them. Right. It's, um, uh, did you see the insane. hard drive retweet of it? That's where I first saw oh, it. No. Did they really just like, yeah, earnestly? okay, oh my God. okay. So, hard drive, which is uh, like the onion for games, yeah, did mm-hmm. a quote retweet of that article and they said, Hey, you know what? Like, this is a good submission, but it's a little too on the nose, so we'll pass. <laughs> like, as if it was a man. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. That's hilarious. Uh, Anna, do you have one? 
Yeah. Um, okay. I'll uh, I'll keep up with this sort of a trend here. It's not funny, but um, <laughs> it's very timely. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, there's this website called everydayarcade.com. And I always revisit this every four years. Well, I found it four years ago today. And then I thought was thinking of it because of recent events, obviously. So it's a game called the Voter Suppression Trail. And it's interesting because it ran as an op-ed in the New York Times. And so I um, remember being a student and seeing a video game in the opinion section of the New York Times. And thinking, yeah. huh, that's really cool. And it was one of those games that gave me a sort of nudge to be like, oh, maybe people will take this more seriously. Um, but it's a great little game, quick to play, browser-based. And basically all the mechanics are centered around the various ways that... Um, people are prevented from voting. And it's called um, Voter Suppression Trail? Yeah, it's just called the Voter Suppression Trail. Is it like the Oregon Trail? Like, gameplay-wise? Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, it is. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> I don't know if they're going yeah, for Yeah, like, like you're trying to survive the line. Um, ah, you're trying to make okay. it through the line. Perfect. Well, then, here's a perfect segue. Uh, here's an article from Vice that Jacob Geller, friend of the show, uh, posted in our Slack. I thought was interesting. Um, it is... The so Mech, the company that eventually owned the Oregon Trail and really had it uh, blow up in a huge way, and again, this is all ties back in. I thought I should know this because I've been so heads down focused on Mech and the Oregon Trail with the release of Trailheads or Oregon Trail documentary. But Jacob Geller pointed to this article from Vice, where apparently Mech, that company, in 1992 released a game called Freedom, which was a simulation of uh, slaves trying to make their escape. Uh, throughout American history. And it is bizarre. I had never seen this before. Like they hired like an African-American consultant, but still uh, people had a lot of problems with this game because it came with like an educational packet and they encouraged schools to like simulate slavery in the classroom. Uh, And so here's a quote from the article saying, a group of African-Americans parents complained to teachers and then to Mech directly that freedom was offensive and Nintendoized slavery. In particular, the game's use of dialect and general depiction of blacks exposed their children to ridicule. Which is something I wouldn't even think of. But like, yeah, imagine playing this in the classroom. Like, of course, it's going to be like, all right, well, let's carry this through and keep joking around because we're silly kids. Uh, It is a bizarre chapter in Mech's history. uh, And it's worth looking at some screenshots of that game. Uh, But yeah, that's it. Uh, Freedom, the game from 1992, everybody. Uh, Anybody else get a load of this? I know you're last second here, Charles. Yes. So uh, get a load of this. Uh, this is a semi shout out to a friend of mine, but uh, uh, the rapper Richie Branson, um, who is a friend that is out in uh, San Francisco, uh, he's recently uh, he recently had to go through like uh, a cancer scare um, in his throat. Um, so it has like messed up a lot of his uh ability to perform and and whatnot for long sessions but he's been having a resurgence uh, because it's been uh two years uh for in remission i believe um so uh one of his songs um is a sequel to a song that he did from a while ago called mecha god um and it's mecha god 2 and i just wanted to shout that out because it's really really good and like like his he's also been uh, like released an album that was like five years in the making because of the cancer uh, and things, but like, it's really, really good. Oh, nice. Nice shout out. Uh, in the community, get a load of this. They have a whole channel in the discord. You get access to if you support us in any tier. Um, and they constantly update this channel. It's an awesome news feed. Uh, Alex posted in there that arcade one up has announced outrun, which is their first seated arcade cabinet. Arcade one up, you know, those, they have the mini mm. versions of a bunch of different oh. arcade games. And this is the first where they have the actual seat for this racing game. It looks insane. Huh. I'm still is the seat also mini. Uh, yeah, you won't fit in it. Uh, no, it looks oh. like you can actually sit in this sucker. Uh, but just like the actual cabinet itself is just a little bit smaller. But mm. they have just been releasing so many of those amazing ones, and I, they're always sold out. Like at WalMarts and stuff. When I walk by, I think they're doing really well. Oh, what a weird idea. Um, yeah. But thank you to everybody that submits those get a loads of this if you want to frame it that way. Um, okay, plugs. A uh, reminder, we have Extra Life going on Saturday for 24 hours straight. It'll be a fun stream for charity. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, come tune in. I promise the vibes will be positive and the donations will be flowing and it will be silly. There's a lot of fun segments there. There's a schedule on Game Informer's site. Um, anybody else have anything else to plug? 
buy, buy Hyperdot. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> buy Hyperdot. Uh, Cross this game. It's genuinely a great game from this year if you like arcadey uh, stuff. It's the best way oh, to I guess a random plug of mine. Um, uh, I recently was able to do a GDC talk. Um, oh, awesome. It, it was on... Uh, basically my journey into becoming like getting into like the games industry and stuff. Uh, but it applies to everyone. So I, I wanted to just like throw that, throw that out there and see if uh, anybody would benefit from here and here in the talk. And is it public? Uh, it is public. It's on the GDC web, uh, YouTube channel. So what should people uh, look for? Uh, you should look for jumpstarting your creativity. There uh, we go. Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. So well, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah. I really enjoy uh, coming on here. That's very nice. Honor to have you. And thank you to all of our $50 supporters on Patreon. The Bam Box, I'm 8-Bit, Mirko, Rico Torreno, Zachary Pliggy, Rebecca Lang, Beaten Down Brian, Brian with a Y, Captain Subs 1. Charles, you know the community well. Do you know who comes up next on that list? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, I, I know. I'm it's sorry. Mark Seliga, of course. Then Jawar, hey. hello. Ludwig Roque, Andrew Valla, Jesse Fatelli, Sam Miami 83, Thomas Hoster, Snake 24, Yaro, William Garcia, Spiral in Your Eyes, Richard Smut, Spider Dan, Alex Payne, Pretham, Yarla Gata, my favorite name to say every week, JT Fell, Steve Bamdad, and Chris. Thank you so much, everybody. Be good, have fun, let's go. Let's go.